All right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, a.k.a. Some Gadget Guy, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series. <sighs> I did a little hitch breath in the middle there. I was totally cheating. Um, but of course, for the SGGQA podcast, the QA is the most important part. That stands for question and answer. And uh, this week is special. So uh, on Thursdays, uh, my buddy and I, uh, we do a little Thursday night old guy tech hangout called The Best of Our Week. And unfortunately, uh, we just weren't able to pull together a show last Thursday. But that means Monday morning, folks, as we chat out news and we get this back and forth and we get this Q&A session going, that means you've got two, two Two hosts in one. As I bring on my buddy, one Mr. TK Bay. Thanks so much for uh, jumping in on the on the Monday morning show. I don't hear anything. We did a sound check before. And I am now... so sorry. Actually, I inadvertently because I got a call while I was waiting. I put myself on. You mute. muted Keep yourself. Myself. We did the sound check. I promise yeah. you. So this this yeah, podcast yeah. is just plagued with audio issues. So of course As we're it doing was. it live. Yeah, it's no. the tradition. It's the tradition <laughs> that we'd have something kind of go up like that. But TK, thank you so much for jumping in um, as we chat out all of our headlines and and all of the uh, the top news stories. And uh, I just want to kick off, yeah. j- jump right into just a, a little flow, a little chat, a little powder. How was your How was your spring break? Uh, did you guys uh, get to do anything fun? Yeah, you know what? Um, <laughs> if you if you got a chance to catch the video I posted this morning. I I was enjoying a I was enjoying my ride. I I got I finally got my new 24 Model 3 and I took it we went nice. uh, I, as you as everybody does when they get a brand new car you go for a road trip because that's what you do. Mandatory. Uh, so yeah, spend spend some time up in Northern California. Uh, enjoyed actually very different weather, although cold and more rain. <laughs> um, and I got a chance to test it out, drive it, and enjoy some. Now time. wait a minute. I hear from all the EV detractors. I I don't believe you could drive from LA to Northern California in an EV. It's got like thirty miles of range, and it only goes like ten miles an hour. So that's that's probably a lie, there, there, TK. There's a trick. If you get to the top of the mountain with the first thirty miles that you have. You could just roll straight down <laughs> using the regenerative braking, and that's how you make it to, you know, that's uh, see, the I've been doing it wrong blowing, this whole time. It has to be blowing in the right direction, you have to open up <laughs> the sails in the back, and it just, you know, it's smooth sailing. It's really, it's not that hard. L- literally, <laughs> smooth literally, sailing, smooth sailing, <laughs> you know, wind power for the wind. Who cares about sun power? It's wind for the wind. I love it. I uh, love but yeah, it. no, we, uh, Honestly, surprisingly, last time we did this about maybe four or five years ago, there wasn't as many chargers. And on this mm-hmm. trip, there were so many more chargers, mostly Tesla, obviously, because my car. Uh, but for the for us, there's a there's a um, what they call it, like a Tesla destination charger where they have a lounge and an area where you're able to sit down and relax a little bit. So we try to drive to there from L.A. And then from there, we continue to Northern California. And that nice. usually does that sweet spot about, you know, about 200 miles from where we are and then another 200 continuing a 200 and a little bit over. But yeah, no, it was, it was nice. It's actually doable, even going to Vegas, San Diego. Uh, there's a lot of support. And uh, obviously, we're going to talk a little more about Tesla later on. But mm-hmm. I think for the most part, <laughs> you know, I'm enjoying my Model 3. It's good. The upgrades are nice. And uh, it is definitely a noticeable change from the original one. And I didn't realize I, I, I was going to enjoy it as much till I got it. So I'm glad. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, like, we definitely have some... Not great news to chat about when it comes to Tesla and some reports coming out of yeah. of uh, sources on deep background and shenanigans happening within the con- uh, within the company. But at the end of all of this, and however we might feel about the CEO, it's still like there's a product mm-hmm. and people are buying it and driving it, and we still kind of want to get a sense of like what that's like, you know, <laughs> beyond all the political shenanigans too. So when um, I'll be really curious to hear your thoughts as we get to that story too. Of course. Um, uh, just to kind of keep me on pace, and, and I don't want to tie you up for like a four-hour podcast like I've been doing these last couple weeks. Um, 
what kind of stories, what kind of other videos and uh, reviews have you been putting out over the last week? And we'll kick off a little housekeeping. So due to the spring break uh, kind of thing going on for me, it, it, it's kind of been a little bit slow. I pushed out a video last week on the Solos um, chat GPT glasses that I've been testing out for some time. You may have seen them in some of my other videos there. Basically, whenever you see me with the glasses that are not frameless at the bottom, I was using those glasses. Um, and it's been an interesting solution of trying to get AI and getting uh, chat GPT functionalities and translation uh, done on the go with a really good battery life. That's the other thing that kind of surprised me with that. So for the last couple of weeks has been basically the one video I posted today, which in a weird way, it took me about a week to get that out because I was testing out all these accessories. And then, uh, yeah, just basically keeping it there. And I got a couple of things coming in, hopefully in the next uh, in the next few days or so. Brand new tablet from Xiaomi. And um, nice. So some uh, special occasion, uh, maybe with the uh, festival that they're running right now. So working on some stuff, but keeping it light, at least till we get back on, back on the yeah. for, for sure. It, it's like just a little bit of downtime. And it's like, it takes me days to get back into the flow of yeah. I, putting stuff out. Waking up the sitting on, hard. yeah. Yeah, it's like we, so spring break was, was great for all of us. Cause unfortunately we had like a little bout of stomach flu go through the household that, yeah. just right. in time for spring break um which for is the worst but also the best mm -hmm. because you you get your family has time to heal from it right you actually have downtime exactly. but it was really nice where even with marie and i still working at like 60 percent efficiency we weren't having to wake up and do the whole morning routine is like we got we got it wasn't a vacation unfortunately but we got a softer week of of work and and uh disease so uh, i'm kind of in the same boat I've, I've got some stuff out um i'm gonna do just a quick blast through my housekeeping here um oh i actually don't know how to do this with a guest so you're gonna see super, micro view of my window i might just uh, need to do the no just the screen yeah. share well i was gonna say so, no no uh tur turn mine off for a second and, and we'll jump back in when you're done well here let me let me let me let me, let me do, let me do let me do this. Let me see if this works. So we'll do the entire screen and we'll do screen two and we'll share. And then I will bring this in. Ah, there we hey, go. Hey, there we go. Okay, so I can turn off my Yeah, we're doing we're doing it live, folks. This is this is us doing it live. Um so I kinda like uh, this setup better than the way we have it on uh, StreamYard between you and me. I, I the mean shot. there are pros and cons. There are some things about restream that bug the the Monday mornings out of me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, bug the money. Someone's got a case of the Monday morning restreams. Um, but then there are also a few things like uh, obviously we we use different platforms for each other. Okay. So uh sillily enough, I felt compelled to write a review of the three body problem on Netflix. Uh just from my old movie review days, I mm -hmm. do not write spoiler heavy reviews, but I would still caution. If you're interested in the series, uh, don't read this until you've watched it. I really want people to kind of experience and find things. And when I'm analyzing some of my issues with the Netflix show, it still gives away uh, info on what's okay. going on. And TK, have you uh, were you a fan of Three Body? Did you read the books or do anything uh, like that? No, but I, I I tried to start watching the show and couldn't get through the first episode. So yeah, it's tough. It is. It's really tough. It, 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 I, and, and I was trying to do it right before we were leaving for San Jose. And yeah, it's like, mm, nope, I got to dedicate some time. So uh, I'll say this. I'm halfway through the first episode. And yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of visuals there to handle so the process. I, I, to, to, to your, to your, to your um, experience there, I really think Marie would have tapped out if she hadn't had me as an insufferable nerd explaining every little setup Oh, well, this is from book two. Oh, and they're setting this up from book three. And those characters don't really know each other in the book. So what they might be doing is making this the relationship. And I was just like, I was that insufferable nerd You're that tries to make people watch like uh, Game of Thrones. Okay. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you, no, 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 we I'm all know that that guy who was like, oh, but what you need to know. And in the book, the Starks are doing this and blah, 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 blah. And I never got into Game of Thrones that deep. But three body problem... I'm that guy. <laughs> no, we should have done a uh, watch party on that one for sure. I mean, like, I think it might have helped, but it this is incredibly helped. dense for mm -hmm. e even just for one book. So I'm not surprised by your experience there at all. And I actually comment on some of that in my review. Um, I also got did a little sneak preview, not on the fully 
unlocked version of the Android 15 desktop mode. I'm trying to, I'm and trying not to step on Michal's toes. Yeah, yeah. Because he's been doing the, the deep dive work on flipping flags and flashing ROMs and ADB commands and all that stuff. I just wanted to see what happens if you plug a pixel into a display with Android 15 developer preview too. So you can see what the framework of that looks like right now. Mm -hmm. And then I also did one more editorial just as a follow-up to our experiences on the Snapdragon X Elite. Yeah. Uh, I really feel like we're starting to see some really positive coverage, uh, tech sites that are giving it some really warm um, potential editorials yep. and reviews and stuff yeah, like that. Because it's starting to be, we're getting closer to for it to become a reality, like actual hardware yes. companies talking about it. It, it was Pretty exciting close. to see what we got a chance to, yeah. So my my big criticism still is I, I, I wish Qualcomm could get ahead of some of our power consumption conversations. Yeah. And we've talked about that a bunch on the pod. Literally, like last week, we did kind of an impromptu pajama podcast. Okay. And it ended up being like, one rattles on about X Elite <laughs> again. So we, we don't we don't need to retread all that. Um, and then on the Patreon, I've got a preview editorial just talking about um, Apple and the DOJ. Mm -hmm. But also that Apple can't be the only company that gets this kind of scrutiny. That's Apple true. is sort of a necessary first step. And if we, if we want to talk about that later on in like the second half of the podcast, we can kind of step on some of that a little bit too. But I also wanted to share just some of my own personal experiences. I was an Apple product specialist for a contractor who did DOE contracts in, in New Mexico. Like I was working with labs and we were had our hands in the guts of PowerMax and XServes. And it, it was a really glorious time for Apple hardware. And then personally, I kind of felt like they started walking away from what I liked. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people will agree with you on that. It has been a lot of uh, shift into those, uh, the way Apple's been approaching not only just product design, functional features, and even, uh, you know, software uh, options that they're putting in there. I mean, it's changing. Yeah. But yeah, we'll definitely dive into that. I think that's, that was a good editorial. So before we hit the news block, um, I, unfortunately, I can't find a way to do the chat setup with two hosts and also feed in the audio for my fanfares of glory, okay. which are terrible. Um, one Mr. Dave Burns is, is uh, subscribed with uh, Prime, uh, and uh, I, I thank him for his support. And for his, uh, 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 like for anyone who's who's supporting the podcast. But before we we jumped in, oh, so sorry, he gets the fanfare of glory. Um, but real quick, before we get into the news block, this is something that I can throw to you as a question. Dave Burns says he needs MacBook advice for his sister. Okay. And you have more experience with MacBooks than I do. I know Dave is an Android user, but I think he prefers Mac OS. For okay. his for laptops. His yeah. So, um, oh, and apparently he also got norovirus at Easter. So there you go. Okay. We're all simpatico. We're like multi-device operating system people that have intestinal issues. So welcome that's, spring, that's spring fever. Doing. That's all I can say. Like it's, it's weird. The weather changes and we start <laughs> getting a whole bunch of stuff, but yeah, no, no, for sure. And um, so I'll probably say overall for Mac users, it depends on the user, on the the power, well, not necessarily the power, but like the performance that you're looking for. Um, honestly, if there was anything that I would probably say right now, if you're buying a brand new, I think the Mac, the M3 Air is probably much more of an all around easy to recommend. It's light, it's powerful, good battery life. Um, nothing's wrong with the M2 series as well. If you're looking for something that has been for a little bit and you can definitely benefit from uh, just overall, uh, you know, not that old, but still performance that is close enough to what we're getting there. Uh, I'm still mm -hmm. rocking the M1 Max, so I, I probably will say that if you're able to find a good one in, in a good, decent shape, you can even probably go there. Well, that that's actually what my question was going to be. So he's saying um, she should get like 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage, Minimum. but at a certain yep. price cap. Mm -hmm. Oh, with 1500 uh, on that one. Yeah, that you're, you're floating around the air, the air side at that point. But, but also like... Because I don't live in the Mac world mm -hmm. as as uh, in, to any great degree. Like I like picking them up and playing with them, and I've done a lot of like testing work, but I haven't really tried to incorporate a MacBook into my daily flow. Yeah. 
is is there a cost savings like you look at some of the refurb prices direct yeah. from Apple, where Apple has certified and refurbished this machine, and it does not look like a bargain to me. Well, it doesn't look like that. They're much adding of a the Apple tax back into it, right? I mean, you're getting exactly, a refurb, but you're adding you're getting it from Apple. You're getting a certain level of guaranteed in there. It's and oh, the, the sixteen fifty uh, five twelve, I think, is a bare minimum. I feel like one for me at least, one terabyte is too small. Mm -hmm. Two terabyte would have been the right size. But I deal with <laughs> a, lot, a lot of larger file formats, videos, and so on. So that's going to be very different than the average. Well, when yeah. I average on in general, Some, someone working to, more browser and web based, no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, sixteen gigs of RAM is more than enough on a Mac. Surprisingly, I feel like on a Windows, I probably will say thirty two. But for for Mac, sixteen seems to be pretty decent. Um, I don't. I the reality I'll say is this: if you're not afraid from refurb. I think refurbs are actually in a certain position to be in a better position than a regular one because they've been basically manually vetted as opposed to what your typical standard um, off the uh, off the production line that gets basically QA'd every once in a while. Your unit may not have been the one that was actually QA'd. So it's a little bit of a different situation. Um, I know that Apple it sells them, but I also know that I think Amazon has uh, uh, basically refurbished uh, units as well. So you may want to try mm -hmm. Amazon as well and see if there's anything. But at the end, I'll, I'll say is if you're not worried or afraid to try to use Swappa, Swappa also may be a good position to try to look for used oh, yeah. PCs. Because originally when I was getting my Mac, I was looking through Swappa for many different uh, configurations, different options. And they're typically well-versed and they're willing to share any kind of specific data you want, either you know battery health, system health, uh, software update, all of that good stuff that you want before you even make the purchase. So there is also that factor that I feel like would be a good function uh, if if you're if you're able to find something close enough for you. But yeah. so especially hearing like uh, that she's going brow like it sounds like she needs a lot of like heavy 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 web browsing, which of course that's that's a RAM issue. That's a RAM you issue. Really can't get away with eight gigs of RAM. But it doesn't sound to me like it would be too much of a step down to hit like an M2. So no, like a last no. generation, yep. and, and especially if you can find like a really, really nice machine used or a good refurb is probably the better way to bump up your storage and RAM specs and not find any significant like performance degradation because the M2 is still a, a rocking chip. Oh, dude, even the M1 is. I mean, seriously, I'm still rocking the M1 Max, and I'm like, there is no reason for me to jump. This is the, this is the weird conversation yeah. to kind of say like, Apple's silicon and OS has been so optimized, so well optimized, and apps run it so well on them. There has not been a reason for me to say, oh, this thing is too slow. This is not running for yeah. me. I am running a pro, not a standard air. Now that you said that out loud, the next version of Mac OS is going to tank your performance. Pretty much. So, yeah, that's... the machine becomes a, a <laughs> paperweight and will basically take six hours to boot. And, you know, DaVinci will be like, what are it's, you it's running the... now? It's the way it goes. It is it's the way just it goes. how gonna, tech Let me turn happens. off auto-update real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think that's probably the better strategy, especially if you're concerned. I, I, there was the, I don't know what it is, but Threads has now become the, the, the pissy, toxic argument place for tech fans okay. where no thread pops up into my field of view through the algorithm, the Facebook algorithm, unless it's a... Uh, a really toxic iPhone user talking trash about green bubbles, or sounds, it's someone trying like to host Facebook algorithm for some reason. That's typical. Funnily that's enough. That's how that's how, yeah. that's how Facebook works. Give you so, negative shit to get you upset. Yeah. The Sorry. the the the, uh, the 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 debate over the last week was, oh, I don't have any problems using my MacBook with eight gigs of RAM. I'm so great. And you're like, really? For machines over a thousand dollars. If you genuinely aren't taxing this performance on M3s or M2s, then that also means you probably wouldn't notice any performance difference going down to like a Core i3 Chromebook. Like, that's fine. Go enjoy your Mac, but let's not pretend that a brand new machine with 8 gigs of RAM is somehow a good buy from, it, from it's, Apple. It's, such a, it's a, such a stepping option with Apple. And, and because we can't upgrade anything on these machines, it is it is crucial for you to go into it with the right configuration. Because yeah. you I can't upgrade. My, my only, my only <laughs> literally to this day, my only regret about my, Mac, uh, about my uh, MacBook Pro is that I went with the one terabyte. I splurged on the RAM mm. and skimped on the, on the storage. And I'm like... I should have gone for one more. Should have gone. Because yeah. I've had it. I mean, obviously, I've, I've supplemented an external drive. But then again, it's like, 
there are options for you to try to figure things, but RAM is one thing you can't change. You cannot plug in an extra stick of RAM. So Just download some more RAM. Exactly. You know, like, why don't you, <laughs> is, that's the software thing, right? They can do what they do in the software and the phone, right? You can just extra four gigs of RAM from your storage. Um, I'll, I'll say 16 minimum. And if you want to save a little bit of money, maybe buy then just maybe get a SanDisk external drive. You can get a decent priced SSDs or like external drives, like one or two terabytes for a lot less than what Apple is charging for that bump from 256 yeah. to 512. But if you are going to be running a lot of web browsing, surprisingly, like I say, Chrome per se is a RAM yeah. system. Yeah. 16 will definitely be the bare minimum. And if, again, depending on what you're thinking about doing, if you're running programs that are going to be web hungry at the same time, then you may want to start looking into higher. But uh, for me, we're running 64. I've never gone over 48, uh, like 32, 35, 36 is roughly what I've maxed out when I'm running DaVinci and Chrome with like 16 tabs and stuff. So I, I, I think, like I said, 16, 512, Last year's model will still work perfectly for generally everything that you need. There's more than enough power on the M1, M2, and M3. You won't really yeah. notice the difference. The only time that'll make any any sense or any kind of substantial things is if you're producing stuff like content, yeah, video so rendering, if, if, if or that, anything, editing like that. Yeah. If that doesn't sound so, I'm I'm glad to hear you say that. I feel like my advice wouldn't have been way off the pulse. My advice would have been you've got a fifteen hundred dollar cap. Mm -hmm. buy as much RAM as you can for $1,500 and then don't worry about the chip or the storage as much. Between the three, it's yes. browser and web, browser and web-based. And then that means you're not going to be concerned if you go from, you know, like maybe you were shopping an M3 Pro, but that takes you down to an M2 stock. Mm -hmm. If you're browser and web-based, web -based, then, you know, getting 32 gigs of RAM is plenty of room for activities and the chip in the machine isn't going to be taxed at all still so okay i i feel like that's that's pretty good advice uh and dave thanks for one thank you again for supporting uh production on the channel and then also uh, hopefully that can kind of help your sister out uh the other thing that i wanted to talk about real quick and someone already beat me in the uh, in the comments uh Sorry, I I, it, it, I had to wait for it to refresh. I actually stalled so that we could ask that question. That was to stall. Um, one of the major news stories that broke over the last week was this floating rumor that the new Google Find My Network was going to be uh, kicking off. Mm -hmm. This morning, on that rumor, I sent a message out to the uh, PR team over at Pebblebee. Yeah. And Pebblebee is a company that makes these little Bluetooth trackers. They're kind of like tiles, but, you know, obviously the different form factors and stuff. And this is the fastest I've ever gotten a reply from anyone working in PR. It was literally like 45 seconds later. Um, <laughs> the PR the manager at Pebblebee was fine. like, we're publishing at 9 a.m. Pacific. We're publishing at 9 a.m. Pacific. <laughs> and so on the Pebblebee website, and this is one of the, the breaking stories over the last week, um, oh, that, that doesn't work. Yeah, I got it. Got it. <laughs> there we go. Hold on. Hold on. Doing it live. There we there go. We um, Pebble be set to deliver Google's Find My Device compatible products to transform item finding industry. So this is their actual press release um, uh, talking about the new Find My network coming, coming uh, soon. Uh, devices are going to be in pre-order. They've got little clip tags, kind of like air tags. They also mm -hmm. have wallet sort of card uh, style tags. And then they also have this cute little rechargeable puck. Um, so already we've got Chipolo, we've got Pebblebee. I have to believe Tile is gonna be in this too. And uh, I don't know, have you fired up the, uh, the, um, the, the Find My app no, recently? I I haven't actually, so, uh, typically I don't, but I know that uh, I got a notification to set, when, I guess when I was setting up my tablet uh, to turn on Find My, but that's typical with that, with devices. So we had that for some time, but yeah. So Find My has already started incorporating mm -hmm. a yep. an Android wide um, location tracking setup for headphones. Mm -hmm. So as oh, long as yeah, you're yeah. working with Find My, the Find My service, because our headphones don't have AirTag style back and forth device location, Bluetooth technology built into them yet. I imagine that a lot of companies are going to start adding that to their charge cases for true wireless earbuds. I, I hope but they, yeah. if, if you've noticed, like a lot of um, earbud apps will have this weird location permission. And that's because the earbud app will say, 
hey, um, when you disconnect from the phone, the phone will remember its location where you disconnected from your earbuds. Mm -hmm. And now that seems like it's a core thing just built directly into Google's Find My. Okay, good. So, yeah. um, so now, if you, if you look in, if, if you check, sorry, I'm I'm rambling about. That. I'm I'm really excited about this because we've been talking about this for a year now. Um, when you go into the Find My app, it's actually keeping track of not only your phones, which is an, a ridiculous list for TK and I, I of all the phones and tablets on our on our accounts, but it's starting to also track your headphones. So now we should have a little bit better um, location awareness for some of our accessories. Yeah, especially if you don't keep them closer, like my son always misses them and puts them in different places. I know we've had the the option, I think a long time ago, where they would play an audible thing as long as they're connected. Yeah. So if they're connected over Bluetooth, you're able to make them make a sound so you can kind of find them. But yeah, no, knowing where you last connected to those uh, to the uh, to the hardware, especially if the power dies on the buds, it's also very helpful. At least zeros zeros down on the uh, having you uh, search the yeah. entire house or go in the car and start looking up. I mean, it just it gets crazy. Those things are tiny. I've lost some. I've lost a few actually. So I, we we um I, I was gonna wait and talk about this later in the podcast, no. but um they published th this them. is they kicked us it, off. It, 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 it's the kickoff and we're getting the official release and the, the app is getting updated. I just would like to kind of reiterate and to, to sort of repeat my angry soapboxing oneness of, of uh, pointing the blame at the right company. Yeah. Google's updated Find My Network was announced at last year's Google I.O. Exactly. Yeah. It was one of the, Back one in, of the biggest thing. Yeah. Back in May <laughs> of last year. We we're almost I at had, the next uh, Google I.O. We're, we're almost at the next oh, Google yeah, I.O. Exactly. Um, I've had pre-orders in for Pebble B and Chipolo. I never mm -hmm. did get um, any reaction from Tile. So the question I had for Tile was, because I have some old Tile trackers, would they yeah. be compatible or would they be able to, like, could you update them? I don't know what the different protocols would be. And Tile never got back to me at all. But Pebble B was really excited, like, oh, we, you want to talk about trackers? We can talk about trackers. Um, unfortunately, even though I've had pre-orders since June, nothing has shipped because Apple has been stalling Android's launch because Google waited until Apple could update the iPhone. So I would just like to point out for anyone who's concerned about privacy and security that Apple is so terrible at device location security, it took them 11 months to update the iPhone to give iPhone owners better notifications when trackers were in their location or maybe possibly abusing location data. Yeah. So I, anyone who's worried about privacy and security, it's fine. You can like your iPhone. You just have to acknowledge that they are so bad at this that they kept you on the hook for 11 months before they finally were able to incorporate this for their customers. Because this doesn't affect us Android people at all. <laughs> we had to solve AirTags as a terrible product all on our own because Apple couldn't figure out how to do that. Google had to do that. So I just kind of feel like, you know, fair is fair. That's that's the story, and that's really how we should be talking about it in the media. <laughs> I, I No, no, I support you with that. But I mean, it, it is, it's very, uh, I'll say that I'm glad at least Google was able to allow it to make, to wait for the, for both systems to be compatible before releasing it because it's kind yeah. of like, uh, you know, you, you preempted and then Apple just never has any kind of incentive to kind of ever kind of jump on the bandwagon. If you don't release it and you wait, you wait, you wait, at least you, you run a better compatibility, yeah. better support. You, yeah. You know, Apple would have had ads out about Google and they're trying to, they're trying to spy on you. And even though that's exactly what they did with AirTags, oh, Apple's marketing absolutely of would have made it If look. you've ever watched anything or heard anything about them, is people use them to track people outside. They use them, <laughs> they put them on their cars, and then you're driving around and you're like, why am I being followed by this tag? And then you're yep. like, oh, yeah, that's why. You know, like, no, no, seriously, th this is 90% of what people use them. Or even when they, you know, when they use them to, to track like uh, luggage and so on, there are they're general uses. Sure. But the end of the day, though, is... We need better compatibility between both. Android should be able to know if an AirTag is following them, and an iOS yeah. should know if, let's say, uh, uh, you know, a Pebble B or a Tile or anything a is basically yeah. exactly anything that is used for tracking that is in your vicinity and stays in your vicinity for an extended amount of time. You should be aware of it, and you should be able to find it. This is it, there is no reason unless you put it there. There's no reason for for it to be hidden, and I am. 
we're making baby steps. I'm sure Google will have a conversation about that in I/O coming up in the next, I think, next month, right? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. I think we're, we're I have to. There. I have to believe that this is going to be yet another talking point at I/O. But like with now, we've got a little momentum on actually talking about this stuff, and I believe I don't think there's any date in here mm -hmm. for when these products are going to start shipping. I'm just hoping. Oh no! Your, okay, your pre-order. The the um. So yeah, this is from the official Pebblebee site. Um, so highly anticipated Pebble B made for Google certified card clip and tag devices for Android are available for pre-order now mm -hmm. with shipping expected to begin in late May. The mm -hmm. item finders are also expected to be available in stores as early as late May and available on the Google store in June. So Google doesn't sound like they're going to be coming out with their own dedicated tracker. It sounds like they're really trying to work relationships with Pebble B and Chipolo and Tile to make this a broader network of, of open accessories. And I bet you Google is also gonna be very aggressive um, certifying location awareness for Qualcomm's uh, earbud chips. Oh, the new W5, uh, the new W6. The, the, yeah. the, the Bluetooth earbud chips so that the next generation of earbuds will probably have you know, this kind of tracker technology, more, more robust tracker technology built in. Yeah, yeah, of course. And enough that it doesn't kill the battery. It's more optimized. It leverages the Bluetooth LE probably is something to the effect of where you're able yeah. to find your bu your buds in case you miss them. Or if they're just sitting next to somebody else that you know, and then you're like, oh, hey, it's sitting at, I forgot about my brother's house or something like that. Makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. Um, just real quick, because I, I wanted to take a look. Um, so if we pre-order, so like, uh, I, I want to see this tag. So the tag isn't like the air tag, but um, it's more the, it the looks credit like... card style, right? It's the one that's supposed to be flatter. Oh no, no, no! Th this isn't the the card. Sorry, this is the um, this is the rechargeable. Okay. So it's oh, a small puck, puck um, yeah. and I'm trying to see. So like they've got like one of them here is they've got the puck attached to a television remote. If you're always losing the remote, you can tape this little puck thing to <laughs> oh, it. Oh man, it's, it's really cute. I'm trying to find something that would show the size, but. Um, well, they've got uh, it hidden under a bicycle seat. They've got it on a mini drone, stuff like that. So oh, it's, a, it's mean, a little guy, yeah. but this is the, re this is the one where it's rechargeable and mm -hmm. the rechargeable puck is going to sell for $35, uh, two pack for 65, four pack for 120. I love this. It's a, look at their sale. It's normally $120, but if you buy the four pack, you pre-order, you can get it for $119.99. Dude, you got to count those pennies, but uh, I, right? I love the fact that they decided to use Android's logo <laughs> from like 25, 20, 2005. I know. For some like, come on, man. At least <laughs> it's like. <laughs> so the rechargeable looks looks pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the clip, which is yeah. not rechargeable, but it's got one of those long lasting uh, up to a year. The battery, oh, yeah. it is rechargeable. I'm sorry. Their, oh, their is clip oh, is also using, rechargeable. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right there. First thing. Yeah, for the rechargeable. Yeah. Uh, Holy cow, I did not know that. I thought this was going to be one of those watch battery solutions. This is going to be $30. So it's $5 cheaper, and it's got the little um, eyelet for yep. adding your uh, key ring. And then the card version um, is, again, going to be 35 So all of these, they say they're rechargeable. I'm going to have to look this stuff up. Um, I, I had pre-orders in just for the most air taggy style mm -hmm. for Pebble Bee and Chipolo, but I think I'm going to have to bump up my pre-order and also get some of these other like card and uh puck I, I style. like yeah the, the card styles i like because they're thin they're easy to uh, basically you can put it in, in more versatile areas it doesn't make a lot of thickness in there um yeah but the puck ones obviously you know for backpacks for for anything that usually has a hook in there you'll be able to put in there it always helps especially if you lose things um I'm, I'm a little bit, I feel like they're stretching the capabilities of it when they put it on a remote. Because I'm like, <laughs> I know. <laughs> Although, I mean, come on, we all have like that one uncle I who do, like, yeah. Well, He's actually, always complaining I, about stuff like that. Where and is, you the, could, where you is like, the freaking remote? Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, I know. exactly. And, and I'm not going <laughs> to deny the fact that my son has unintentionally, conveniently mislocated the remote somewhere. And then usually it's somewhere in the couch, deep diving into the couch. 
um, it, definitely. If if this is a, a true concern for you, I feel like that yeah, the puck will definitely work. Uh, I'm wondering though, if is it magnetic though? Would it be like more of a magnetic nah. configuration? Because the way they no, had it I, sitting under the chair uh, under the bike seat, I was hoping. I guarantee you, it's, it's some kind of like adhesive or adhesive, something like Velcro that. They're just thing. showing it as a as an example of where you might want to hide it, one. It, it's a good but. it's a good one for the for the bike because it that's a typically a, a thing that always stays on even when you lock it. So even if you take the uh, the front wheel out the seat stays there so yeah that makes sense good so we got a question here from clay lynch how many trackers do you both own so i got man i want to say it was like 2021 or no actually i think it was pre-pandemic so it might have been 2020 oh, wow. um i i got uh just for the family because we were planning no okay so it was pre-pandemic because we were planning on travel so we were definitely not in the pandemic um i got two of the multi-packs Mm -hmm. So, uh, of tiles. So I have like four of the little like keychain things yep. and two of the cards, but, um, really the only thing that we've ever stuck the tiles to our luggage. Yes. Well, um, that's 90% of why you always, you know, it, again, backpacks, luggage, things that stuff are, like that. yeah. Yeah. It, like you just want to be able to kind of track and continue with, uh, I, for me I actually don't have as much. I actually have like maybe at, at most 10. And only six of them, I think, are still being used because for the most yeah. part, I just I've had a few battery dies on me and I just never you know, bothered to replace. Um, and with, as you said, kind of with the pandemic kind of situation going on, uh, I was the only one traveling for the most part. Um, and then yeah. me and my wife and my son would come with me on a couple of trips. Last year was definitely more. Uh, but this year, is, or at least where we are now, I'm actually looking forward to getting some of the newer technology and the newer tax. So I may actually jump in on the Pebble B one or just wait till it shows up at the stores and, and pick up a few. I like the card yeah. and the the hook option ones, uh, the, the the pucks, not as much, but uh, I definitely would need <laughs> at least, but, you know, 10, maybe 10 to 12, uh, you know, right out of the box just to keep things specifically, not just for me, but for my son. So he knows where things yeah. are for him uh, at school or whatever. God forbid something happens. He knows exactly where to find it. So um, they're good. They're well, helpful and they're small. And, and same thing, because like this is one of the reasons why we got Lex that fancy. Oh, there's going to be a new version of that TikTok watch. Yeah, that was that actually new watch, the this Final last, Friendly ones. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, this last week, too. But that was one of the main reasons why we got that watch was it was a cellular connected low jack for my daughter. Yeah. So you can't really, so unfortunately, in each grade from first grade to second grade, enough kids play with gadgets during the day that we're not allowed to let her wear it. Mm -hmm. But what we do is we just kind of keep it in her backpack. And as a passive track, we might add something like one of these pucks or keychain solutions to her backpack. Exactly. At least we know where like the last moment was when she was over here. So um, it, it, it's I, I'm more excited about this um, one because of this broad accessory collaboration. Yeah, that it's not Google made this one AirTag clone, and it's the exact same thing as the AirTag, and then it's going to take years before we see like, like our electric bikes have mm -hmm. Apple's location tracking built into them. Yes, so that kind of stuff. I can't wait for that to show up also on on Android for, side for the Android side. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't think it's going to take as long to start seeing that happen because of Google saying, hey, we're not actually gonna make the hardware, but you get the benefit of using all of our Android devices out there to contribute yep. to this network. And I think that's gonna give it a big shot in the arm. I'll be curious to see if a company like Tile, at some point, will they push back against this? Because they were trying to build their own network. They were never given the same access to location data that Apple gives itself on the iPhone, but Apple was happy to take their business model and build it directly into, into their the iPhone. AirTag. Yeah, no, I, I remember the, because we've used, I used to use tiles also. Um, yeah, on, a lot. Beyond Verizon's network, you'd be able to basically just, it It, it was light years ahead of where, where you know, we really needed them. I think they, they were way ahead of what we needed. And when we did get the need for them, uh, you're right. Apple just took it over, and then suddenly AirTags were the only reference, and everybody no, nobody remembers Tile like as if they didn't exist. Yeah, we'll have to see. We'll have to see how that kind of their approach to it is. It, it's a little bit harder now with, because I'm saying is with Google going into it, them also probably being part of the conversation as well. Uh, do they want to fight the, uh, the the system or do they want to champion it and make it so that it becomes a standard, so that we no longer have that conversation? Because it's it's a tougher yeah. game now when you have both tech giants agreeing to it, both of them supporting it. And 
you, I, I, it's sad to say, but it's almost like you either adapt or you, it's harder to kind of survive. You adapt or die. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, a, it's a tough one because more than likely people will use the, the more standardized approach that will work across devices as opposed to having to find something that's more unique. Again, I'm not everybody, but I'm just, it's more of a how I look no. at it. It's, it's an adaptation kind of thing. You have to. And, and yeah. as my recommendation going out, I'm probably going to recommend devices that pump directly into a uh, a tech giant's platform. Yeah. Because at the at the end of all of this, like if someone is telling me that they want something for this kind of security or for this type of of uh, peace of mind, mm -hmm. the Tile network is functional, yeah. but the Google network is immediately going to be more detailed and more robust. Exactly. And this is going to be tough for a company like Tile that has invested so much money in their infrastructure, but it's going to be a huge shot in the arm for Pebble Bee and Chipolo, who have made hardware, and they have their own networks, but now they're not leveraging as much of their cash flow exactly. maintaining this network because they're selling the hardware that's going to work on some other established platform. So I'll be really curious to see how this plays out. I think it's going to be really good for um, for the, some of these, I, I, I mean, I don't want to say smaller companies, but less visible yeah, companies up, in this up space. Up and coming companies. I mean, these are companies that are still, yeah. like you said, you pre-ordered back in June, you know, May or June of last year. Well, they, they've had whole, options yeah. and they've had like solutions that have been, eventually they licensed Apple's tracker network. So you can buy, I think you can buy Pebble Bees and Chipolos that are, functional on iOS is find okay. my network. So, but, but again, it's to me, that is, that, that is a stark difference between all of the money and infrastructure and security and it, it, like building up the customer relationships to make your own tracker network. Yeah. When you can just kind of plug your hardware into someone else's solution, I think you end up with an easier roadmap. So I'll just be really curious to see what Tile does with theirs, just because they also were, were recently acquired. Mm -hmm. It's it's a messy transition and a messy transition immediately into Google and Apple rolling their own. Well, I mean, and and I will say that I'm I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's been a little bit of nudging going around with the DOJ conversation going on <laughs> with Apple when when the first thing you say like we're not a monopoly we're we're not wall guarding everything anything you know like we play with others when we're forced to but, but, and only right. when we're forced to we're not engaged in anti-competitive business practices that shut down competition don't look at our air tags <laughs> absolutely not my friend absolutely not we no no definitely I I'll, I'll say look the some of the changes that we're getting for better communication between ecosystem, between platforms, we're seeing more obviously in the EU, more driven by the EU. But again, yeah. at the end of the day, the consumers need to be the ones that benefit from this conversation and having an ecosystem where you cannot, again, having multiple trackers because let's say you have an Android and your wife has an iPhone or something like that. It just doesn't make sense. If people are going to, yeah. you're, you're creating a division between the two camps and there really shouldn't be. You should be able to pick whichever piece of tech that you feel works better for you, be it iOS, be it Android, and still get the benefits of both ecosystems of getting the security, the tracking, uh, communication between the two. So real quick, last, you know, we, yeah, again. last question. And then we'll, we'll move on. Sure. Do you think Google will bring a more robust find my app to the iPhone? Like they've done in the past where they give iOS. But I mean, app. think about it. So, ah. so you, you, you go to your family and friends and say, Hey, yeah, you can do air tags. Totally cool. Yeah. But if you use the Google Find My app, you are opening up to a larger ecosystem of Android devices. There are going to be all of these other tracker style things in the ecosystem, and you'd get the best of both worlds. Do you think get... Google would make a play directly to the iPhone for that as a service? It, it, they could go that far. There's always going to be that limitation of where Apple's mind find my will be able to find Apple products as well. Like what I mean by devices. Sure. And I don't think Google will be able to incorporate find my iPhone into to license find, it directly. Yeah. yeah. So there's going to be that let that they may give more functions to be able to say to the trackers, the Pebble Bees, so on. But where the find my on Android makes sense for us because we can not only track our tablets, our smartphones. Hopefully, yeah. in the future, we'll have our buds. So it's more robust in the ecosystem that it lives in. I think it helps them having a better app on iOS. But I feel like iOS will always have that one leg up because they can not only show the trackers the same way Google will have it on their own native mm -hmm. side. 
it'll be on the other side. But they need to have it. They need to make the app more robust, more functional, and uh, push the conversation with that, making it uh, known that it runs on iOS. It is not just yeah. an Android thing. It's not just an interoperability. It is a functional tool that you can track now. And you can now, if you own an iPhone, pick up a Pebblebee and be able to track on both networks, find it exactly where right? it needs to be. I feel like this would be a really good time for them to try and make the the reach, like even a more aggressive location plug-in for the iPhone, because yep. then if Apple blocks it, you've got more, well, I mean, DOJ, <laughs> look what Apple's doing right now. I just, oof. We're trying to compete, and they're not I, letting. I, you know I, what I, I mean? It's like more, one more tab into that article. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, Pre-orders sure. are up now. I have to believe that Tile and uh, Chipolo are probably jumping into this as well. And make sure you update your Find My app because if you haven't looked at it in a while, it's gotten a significant makeover. I'm um, going to so, uh, right now. I'm going to go into the Google Play Store. And oh, sure it's 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 real there. good. Especially for nerds like me, maybe you have like a like a smartwatch and some mm -hmm. earbuds, stuff like that. At least kick that part of it off where you can do some passive location tracking for where you last used your accessories. It is a, 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 a big peace of mind. It's the thing that we've wanted since we saw the AirTag ne uh, network go live on iPhones. And we're finally starting a year later. <laughs> We're finally starting to reap some of those benefits. Uh, normally, I would start my podcast off with some politics. Uh, I had to break that news first. That, to me, is one of the biggest stories of this week. It, it, the news broke this morning. Um, but we, uh, we should also uh, quickly backtrack. And uh, coming this week, we're going to be getting uh, um, a, a new vote from the FCC uh, on re reinstating net neutrality. Uh, so I do want to just really briefly sure. um, uh, tag team two stories here. So let me go back into screen share. So first from Reuters, written up by David Shepardson, FCC to vote to restore net neutrality rules reversing Trump. Um, I need to scroll down. Okay. Uh, Rosen Worsel sa has said that the reclassification would give the FCC important new national security tools. The agency said in its initial proposal that rules could give it, quote, more robust authority to require more entities to remove and replace equipment and services from Chinese companies like Huawei and ZTE. Um, and then also this is going to be, uh, here we go. Uh, quote, the pandemic made it clear that broadband is an essential service that every one of us, no matter who we are or where we live, needs it to have a fair shot at success in the digital age. So a lot of rhetoric coming from the FCC about reclassifying the internet as a proper telecommunication service, mm -hmm. as mandatory as phone lines and electricity lines, and removing that terrible classification as an information service that happened under Ajit Pai, where the internet became something regulated similar to like how Facebook might be regulated. It's an information service that lives on your phone lines, but no one uses it that way. It is a proper telecommunications infrastructure that should be regulated just like the telephone lines were back in the day. Now, I wanted to bring this up. Sorry, sorry real, real, real quick. I wanted to bring this up because uh, my uh, super nerdy man crush, John Brodkin over at Ars Technica, wrote up this uh, quick um, uh, article, FCC won't block California net neutrality law, says states can experiment. Um, California can keep enforcing its state net neutrality law after the FCC implements its own rules. The FCC could preempt future state laws if they go far beyond the national standard, but said that states can experiment with different regulations for interconnection payments and zero rating. So this to me was a very important aspect of returning net neutrality to a federal conversation. When we lost net neutrality because of Ajit Pai and the Trump administration, New York and California set their own state rules for net neutrality. So if you're a conservative-leaning, pro-business, uh, free market kind of individual, this was the worst outcome you could have hoped for in the net neutrality conversation. You want a, a loose federal standard that everyone kind of agrees to and is highly reactionary. The FCC is a woefully underfunded commission with very mm -hmm. little like 
actual enforcement. Like if something really bad happens, they've got to kick it over to like the DOJ, like we see with Apple. Yep. You did not want California and New York and Massachusetts and all of these other states in between coming up with their own state by state rules for net neutrality. So as we move forward with the federal standard, there's going to be now a sort of base level of what the federal government expects for a telecommunication service and how it should be regulated in the 21st century. But now it's opened the floodgates and you can't put the genie back in that bottle. And, and now every state could have different rules for how they want to either enhance net neutrality regulations or maybe even try to chip away or work against the federal standard. And that's a nightmare for businesses. That's a really difficult environment for businesses to work in. Exactly. And just just from the sense of being able to stay uh, compliant in every single state, the way everything, you know, where things are, it's like, uh, it's almost as bad as just where we used to have it, where not every state required you to pay taxes when you uh, pre-ordered things or you bought online. <laughs> right. And there was yeah. always like loopholes and all of that stuff. And then they finally just leveled the, the game on everything. So everybody pays taxes now, regardless of where you're ordering from. But yeah. the, the, the end of the day, it, it's... It, it, if we're able to have at least the baseline, right? In, in good mm -hmm. theory, in, or at least in, in good conscience, I feel like no state will want to base. Very few states will want to basically go in there and reverse it, maybe enhance it. I feel like that's always going to be a good option. But reversing some of them or canceling certain things will obviously just make it as a, as a nightmare conversation. Um, what Ajitpai did to us back in the day and the way it, the way it passed, it was just. It was so sad the day that, that we were able to basically, like, when, when he was able to do what he did. Let's also say that. And it took us this long from yeah. when he was able to do it to for it to kind of reverse. I'm glad to see that we're getting back to it. I'd like to get that, the I'd say, probably say the classification of broadband, better understanding what broadband is, speeds, requirements, uh, that loose translation of what internet used, was basically put into where it's up to the telecom to basically figure out what they want to do. It's leave them, let them manage it. You know, taking yeah. us back to the, uh, I would call it uh, the Ma Bell or back to the Pacific The Bell dark days. days of, yeah. Back, yeah, no, it, it was a wild <laughs> west of what internet used to be back in the day. And it was controlled by so few people. And it's it's a good move. Um, I, it's, yeah. it's concerning, but hopefully at some point we'll be able to get, again, augmented experiences with, with different states if they choose to. But at the bare minimum, we're all on the same game. We're all in the same field and we're not playing different games. You have no idea what's going on in each state. So it, it's it's a move in the right direction and it's very nicely yeah. welcomed <laughs> to reverse some uh, bad decisions from a few years ago. At least we're I, able and, to and do I that. Think it I think it just speaks to, um, again, why I, I tend to make tech politics such a big part of my weekly show. Yeah. Whether or not you agree or disagree, if you think you're not interested in politics, you have to know that a bunch of rich people and a bunch mm -hmm. of businesses and a bunch of corporations are very interested in the politics and what will happen to your internet experience. And, and so, whoever you vote into those positions in uh, different companies it, with their where where they used to work from, you know, coming in from it Verizon. Still kinda it's, it's, it it's, 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 it still kind of matters. It does kind of matter. We we want to shrug off. I have plenty of criticisms over the liberal side of our political spectrum, how poorly they've handled a lot of these conversations, but there is still a tangible difference between what they're trying to accomplish badly and what the more conservative side of this conversation is trying to do. And I need to keep pointing it out that if you're more of a cloth coat Republican, more of a free market or pro-business Republican, this is not what you wanted. You did not want Ajit Pai doing what he did in removing this classification and removing this light regulatory layer from the FCC because it called so much more attention to it. It got states like California all riled up about it. And now you have a worse outcome because of it. And if we had really focused back in the original open internet order days where Verizon sued the federal government, we would actually be in much better shape now. We would have a much a, a much better understood market landscape, and we wouldn't have this pendulum swing where regulations are going to change every four years, depending on who's voted into office. Exactly. So this isn't the, the, the bleeding heart liberal saying, oh, but don't let companies be too successful. This is literally telling you if you want companies to be successful and you want to make more money, it's a bad tactic trying to shut down net neutrality. You will not get what you want out of this. And obviously, we aren't getting what we want in a fairer uh, marketplace. And uh, the first steps in walking back some of the other terrible business practices 
that we've seen like how ISPs can track all of your data and just mm-hmm. sell it off to anyone who who wants to get a bucket of data on everything you do on the or, internet. Or just throttle your data based on what you're using, like AT&T exactly. around your YouTube connection just because you're streaming on YouTube. That just make I mean, seriously, yeah. some of the, some of the um, or just whitelisting devices just because your uh, your device is running on the, you know, it can't connect oh, to AT&T. It, you know, it's, <laughs> sorry, Pacific Bell turned in AT&T, <laughs> but the practices never <laughs> change. I'm, I, it's sad to say I've lived long enough <laughs> to have used all of their services. My first telecom connection was a, yep. a, a SPC connection. Oh my God. Before SPC got bought out by Pacific Bell, I, or in a, sorry, it was Pacific Bell, SPC, AT&T. Anyways, same company, different letters. Um, yeah, <laughs> for sure. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping, and even just for the lack of a better term, but I want to be able to get more, more broadband, true broadband in more areas, yeah. especially if you don't live in that main metropolitan area. I mean, I went to San Jose and the hotel at in San Jose had 200 megabits up. Yeah, It, it made me cry. I uploaded an entire <sighs> big and a half in 45 seconds. It takes me hours to do it here. It just makes yep. no sense. I, I just, yeah. It's so, killing me. Yeah. yeah. Nope. And again, we, we can't change any of that until we have an FCC that has accurate coverage maps. We have an exactly. FCC that has tighter control over the business practices of these telecoms and ISPs until we get some kind of pushback for terrible business practices and classifications that matter. Exactly. Like for right, I, I'm, I'm even disappointed that the FCC only said broadband is 100 down, 20 up because we already have that. It's, that already that's already for the vast majority of urbanized internet users that is already your top option we need yeah. to be pushing the market not just capitulating to the market so anyway um we, we don't need to spend too much longer on that that vote's coming up i'm fairly confident that this fcc now that it's no longer in deadlock will vote to replace um net neutrality rules you're going to hear a firestorm of conservatives say that it's bad and if you believe them, then I'm sorry, but you've been misled. <laughs> I'm hoping I'm, I'm hoping the the that they've heard from the constituents even more since the original uh, complaint and that they follow through with the right decision. One would hope. But when we uh, I, I, when I posted that comments were open for net neutrality, uh, when we voted on it during the Obama administration, we got millions of comments. And mm-hmm. in part, that was because of John Oliver setting up an easy web landing page so that you could contribute comments to the FCC. If you've ever tried contributing a comment to the FCC, it is a nightmare of web 1.0 interface design. It is terrible. So I think it was the EFF set up a page this time, and I think we maybe tapped out at like 50,000 comments. So there's a lot less visibility. There's a lot less interest on this just because we have exhausted people. We, we worked them up during the Obama administration. We worked them up during the Trump administration. And now it's just like, well, what what is it? I don't even care anymore. It, it's difficult to kind of keep that conversation going. But this is the political ping pong ball that keeps getting batted around. And if you care about your quality of service, your gadgets, your data, this is something that you should still be trying to pay attention to and still be active with. So exactly. hopefully... Hopefully, Hopefully we don't see any crazy shenanigans this week when that vote actually goes live. Um, shifting gears, this is where I need to lean on you. Okay. Because uh, we got to talk about what's going on with Tesla. And uh, oh, every, are we, everything's you, great. You, what do you mean? I'm sorry. What, 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 what do you mean? I'm sorry. Wait, wait, hold on. I feel like this is a personal attack. I know the first I, letter I, of my name is T, but it is not. Yeah. Uh, I don't know ESL. Say. No. Uh, sorry. I, I gotta, I gotta, gotta put you on the spot here. So oh, this is coming by way of Reuters. Yes. Sorry. And uh, uh, this is written up by Hyunju Jin, Noriko Shiroz. I can't pronounce it. I am so sorry. And Ben Clayman. Um, Tesla scraps low-cost car plans amid fierce Chinese EV competition. Mm -hmm. And I need to find something specific in this. Okay, so Reuters says, Tesla did not respond to requests for comment. After the story was published, Musk posted on his social media site, Twitter, that, quote, Reuters is lying, parentheses, again, end quote. He did not identify any specific inaccuracies. So it seems like the least reliable narrator in this whole conversation about all of the awesome work that Tesla is capable of doing is Tesla's CEO. 
<laughs> very vague. Just say lying. Don't even cover anything. No, I mean, the, the reality is, I, actually, one of the biggest news uh, news things that was going on last week is the fact that EV sales are starting to drop and hybrid sales are starting to go up as well. Yeah. Um, it, it's, um, th there's already, a, there's already a lot of, I'm not going to say uncertainty, but um, the, the EV market right now is is growing. There's a massive demand for EVs. Every company is pushing out EVs. We have uh, basically a brand. Every brand has at least one or two variants of a version of a, an EV. Mm -hmm. The issue that's been going on, and I think the biggest thing that's been always going on, and why I've kind of stuck with the Tesla model as opposed to just shifting over to a Pulsar or anything else. But I, at this point, it's starting to look better. Is it's always been the network. It's always been the support of charging and and, and yeah. getting your car up and running. And what's happening is. The network isn't expanding as fast as the cars. The, the makers started started to finally jump on on board, but the charging network hasn't been able to uh, can basically ad adapt to it. So you're getting people getting cars. They're waiting in line. They're charging their cars. Like they're waiting to get into the stall to charge the car before they have to charge, and that's creating a lot of uncertainty and, of course, driving prices down. Well, the affordable version that Musk is, or basically what uh, the article was referring to, is supposed to be the Model 2, which is supposed to be a smaller, more affordable sedan, even more affordable than where we see right now the Model Y and Model 3s are in somewhere, again, around the 30, maybe between somewhere to 20 to 30,000, as opposed to going into the 40Ks. And there is a lot of competition. In China, there is way more competition. BYD has not slept on this conversation. Tesla yeah. has a lot of competition in those markets and outside of the U.S., especially even in Europe. And God help us help Tesla once they are <laughs> able to come to the U.S. Because of the reality is they are so much more like they've developed. There's already technologies in China where you actually do battery swaps on a car. You don't recharge yeah. the car. You swap the battery. Like the same way they've had them with the electric scooters that they've been running uh, in mm -hmm. most Asian countries. You literally stop at a stall, you take out the battery cell, push it in, and you replace it, and your bike is ready to go on a full charge. Having that type of tech on a car is crazy. Like, think about how fast you'll be able to basically just churn in people out, be in and out. You go through a conveyor, like a car wash type of thing. You go in with an empty battery. You go out the other, other side 10, 15, 20 seconds later with a full charged battery, and you just go to your destination. Absolutely life time, you know, life changing. But Tesla is again, this is what happens when you're to a certain point, we have a majority of the market share. You're not really in that mark in the um innovation trying to push things. You're very much in a maintenance mode to a certain point. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's hard. And and they, they I did think, make an announcement. I think that's been the, what what you just said right there, I think has been yeah. one of the concerns that shareholders have been voicing mm -hmm. is that Tesla seems to be um playing defense. Yeah. that we're not seeing what the best possible tech might be coming out of this company. And there's very little, um, what's the word I want to use? There's very little confidence or I, maybe even very little enthusiasm for uh, Elon Musk running to Twitter to talk about robo-taxis. Yeah, I'm like, um, yeah, yeah the robo-taxis. And, and so we've been promised full self-driving for how many years and that your car was going to be able to run and be its own taxi and go make money for you and come back when, you know, whatever. Yeah. All of those things were promised I for years now. And, you know, yeah, so robo taxis are going to be a thing after everybody else has been putting it. But no, you're right. The They've shown us what they can do. And it was amazing. And it, and to me, to a certain point, I still like the simplicity of what um, a Tesla or Model 3 does. Mm -hmm. I like the uh, the improvements that they've done in the Model 3 24 edition. But it took them how many years to add an extra display in the back, give us better suspension. But they've also <laughs> right. done some really weird decisions in that car that drives me as, an, or as a second time model three owner like a like why like why would you do that decision removing mm -hmm. usb-c ports and and barry was commenting on my video uh, in the uh, earlier today they took out two usb-c ports in the front big port and gave us one in the smaller uh, armrest that makes no sense makes me having to buy a, 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 basically a hub just to have more usb-c ports on my car there are some things, like I said, that uh, they are they're not really innovating. They're really more in that maintenance. I'll I'll applaud everything else that they've done, the suspension, the features, the mm -hmm. rear display. They could do so much more though. There's so much more things they could do. And not only that, just full self-driving and making it more accessible to people, yeah. giving us the full potential of what the car can do and, and giving us more than gatekeeping things at you know six thousand, twelve thousand dollars just to be able to get software updates. It it kind of leaves people with a little weird feeling, right? Like I, I just paid so much money for the car, but you're telling me for me to be able to enjoy the full self-driving, I have to pay an extra 12K. But if I want to get enhanced <laughs> autopilot, it's a 6K upgrade. Right. They're not cheap. 
They're not cheap. And most yeah. other companies are not doing that. It, you're getting what you're getting and the cars are, are are better, but they need better network support. So we'll have to see how that kind of develops. But so so there's a, there's a lot of ire. I, I think, you know, a, a lot of emotion gets wrapped up into things like investing. Right. Yeah. I, I don't feel the, the health of a company is ever really related to its share price. It's more the perception of that exactly. company. Mm -hmm. And with Musk kind of going off as this crazy you know, sort of alt-right incel type character, meme lord over on Twitter. <laughs> and, and also that his pet project has been at best controversial, but at worst kind of a flop, seeing how Cybertruck is, is kind of being mocked, you know, in every circle outside of sort of a diehard Tesla fanboy kind of community. Um, the, the most recent video I saw was the Frunk um, has apparently has no sensors for obstruction when you close the frunk. So if your fingers are in the way, you just get an edge of stainless steel slicing your fingers off. Um, um, yeah, it's literally like most, all the videos I've seen. I mean, and not only that, it, it's positioned in a weird way that it's really more seats than anything. There's, you can't really, <laughs> right. it, it doesn't hold anything. There's no front it's, guard on the part and it's just yeah. basically a seat. It's like a bench. It's, it's less trunk bed space than my Saab 900 <laughs> used to have. <laughs> Like if you fold down the, the seats in an old 1980s uh, Saab 900, you yeah. had almost as much truck bed space as like a specked out Ford Ranger, which apparently is more than what you get <laughs> in a cyber truck at like three times the size. It, it's, it's I, I'll say it's one of those, I feel like, um, challenging decisions that they decided to go with on the front. There are other options in there that I think they've made really good decisions and, and interesting look like I've seen quite a few cyber trucks, which is weird. Um, yeah, just charging at the charging station, driving on the freeway, mm -hmm. uh, different color options that I've seen, not just the silver model. Um, look, I, I, I'll i say this. The, the Cybertruck is a unique and very compelling truck. It is not my cup of tea. I, that's why I never nope. jumped in on the pre-orders. I don't yep. really. Yeah, I like I like my car, but I don't like my car to stand out that much. Like I, I, I could have <laughs> gone for the for the super cherry red uh, Model 3 just to kind of you can see me from six you, miles. You away. know what I. You know what I miss? I, I don't know. Were you ever kind of a truck guy? Because I'm, I'm not a big truck guy. I, we've but... owned a truck before. My brother's more on the truck side than I am. I'm more. Okay. I've, I've enjoyed more of the sporty. You know, like the the uh, what's it called? The original, like the Celica, the Supra. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I like. Uh, give, give me, give me a hot hatch, and, exactly, and I'm yeah, with you all day. Exactly. But my dad had a V6 Toyota Tacoma Stepside. Okay. And it wasn't the big lifted four by four. So it was the, the, I mean, it was low, it was low yeah, to the ground. It wasn't like yeah, low rider low. It ran almost like a, about the same height as a regular car to a certain day, Yeah, depending on the model you're able to pick up. And it had that really practical, like, you know, that, that body dimple so mm -hmm. that you could step onto the side of the truck to put stuff in the bed. And it had that really, um, that really chunky old school Toyota grill. I want to say this is mid nineties. And he had that truck for almost like 20 years. Oh, wow. And that truck was a beast. It was so useful. It was so practical. He was never going to be the, I'm going to go take it off-roading and stuff kind of guy. It was this fast, powerful, punchy little truck. And it's like, that to me is like, that is such a sexy automobile. <laughs> like, I loved that thing so much. And it was, and he even had it on the manual. So you could really rev through that V6, that big torquey V6. Um, that, that's the kind of stuff that got me really lit up. So when Tesla truck arrived, I was like, okay, this looks like someone's pet project. It doesn't look like a real consumer facing machine. It, it doesn't look like this is going to be the solution that people are going to take. Yeah. The, the public perception of that, do you think that plays into Tesla making a strategic strategy call on maybe walking back their claims on doing a lower cost Tesla. They're trying to capture the the, the premium market. They're trying to, yep. to not cheapen the label because you've got so much Chinese competition coming out in the entry space. You can't out entry compete Chinese manufacturers in China. Like that's never going to happen. No, no. And they're, they're always going to have the one leg up on, on your manufacturing and the production because you're sourcing your stuff from them to a certain point. Like you're depending on their own you're competing with them much heavier there not in the US yet but i mean part of it, i'll say this i think the cybertruck has been 
I don't think it's functional in the sense of what people buy it for. It's not a truck in the sense you, you're buying it because of a truck. I mean, I've seen people definitely use it. It has a lot more storage than a typical car, but it's still to a certain point. It's not as, so I'll say this. It's not as tall as you think it is. Unless you're running no. it in high mode where you're, you're raising yeah. it higher and you're doing off-roading, it actually runs. I'm actually taller than the Cybertruck and I'm 5'10". Like that, yeah. that's how high it, it's not taller than me. And in the images that we see, we're always seeing that bottoms up kind of like that low angle. Those. Yeah. yeah it, well, it's the same thing they do with the White House. The same thing with a lot of actors. Sure. Yeah. Like you see them and you're like, wait, you're not as tall as I thought you were. I'm like, dude, it's angles. It's all in angles. Just take a photography class or a videography. You'll know it's all in the angles. Um, the car itself, it, I think to a certain point, brings a lot of attention. It shows a little bit more futuristic. I don't think it's going to be the selling off like hotcakes. I think a lot of the pre-orders are going to be the ones kind of showing it off. And that's what we're seeing now. Yeah. A lot of the pre-orders finally started to get their cars. But the Model 2, to a certain point, I, I don't really feel like it would cheapen the product, the product line of Tesla because they're not going down mm. to the 10,000. They're not going down to right. the... It was you know, estimated it was going to be like a $25,000 yeah, vehicle. That is not cheap. Exactly. And that is still something that people would I would need to finance. We'll still have to put in some kind of down payment. There's a lot of other options in there. And it obviously will tailor a lot of the experience of what you get from a Tesla to that form factor. I think the issue for them is right now, if they're deciding to scrap this and move away from it in the U.S. market and they allow other companies to jump into that, that's where they're going to lose. Yes, you're keeping yeah. the premium brand. I'm not going to try to compare it too much to Apple, but it feels very much like an Apple conversation, yeah. right? Like it Apple, does. They, they put the, they put the SE once every two years or so, and we don't never hear about <laughs> them. But otherwise, but, for the most part, you know, it is standard as, and higher. As a fan of like hot little Celicas, I'm a fan of hot hatches. Yeah. Like, I feel Tesla is missing an incredible opportunity to put out a twenty five thousand dollar hatchback. Yeah. And then put out a forty thousand dollar electric GTI competitor, mm -hmm. and just go balls to the wall, you know, track grade, you know, Bring really beef roadster. up the suspension. Yeah, just... it, it, but I mean, it's still a more practical daily driver than yeah, like working. a yeah. really souped up GTI because you know, with an electric and a motor, you can actually kind of play around a lot with your performance curve and mm -hmm. your driving uh, conditions and stuff like that. I just feel like. It, this is the car that I've been waiting for Tesla to make that they won't make. And it's actually probably going to mean I'm going to end up with an Ionic instead mm -hmm. of a Tesla to get sort of the overall dimensions and performance and stuff that I'm looking for. And the for. Ionic just is to me, such a good car. It is such a good car. The Ionic 5s are spacious. They're big. They're yeah. been reliable. They've been upgraded year over year. Um, when I was in um, in Korea, when we were for when I went there for Samsung last year, it was literally a land of Kias. Ionic fives were everywhere. Every <laughs> single Uber yep. we got in was an Ionic, and it it just t shows. Yes, obviously home brand. Uh, there's that conversation, but there's also the fact for sure that it is a reliable car and it is growing in popularity. Um, our buddy, uh, sorry, Josh. I was going to call him Juan, but uh, Josh <laughs> drives an Ionic five. He, yeah. he likes the car. He drives it. It's his daily driver. And it is absolutely a great car. So I don't think Tesla's doing that and himself see, any and, favors. And I, that's actually I, I kind of contributing it. because I think one of uh, one of the first times I, I uh, did something with Josh, I was riding around and he had like a little hatchback. And we were oh, both man, just talking about yeah, how much I we love our that. little hatchbacks. And then he was like, I've got the Ionic 5. And it was like, that is actually the car I want to get so it's like knowing that josh's perception of it and i mean, I mean he's definitely had like pros and cons and he's had some criticisms for his ionic oh, no, no, absolutely yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but going into it knowing like these are some of the trade-offs you're going to tackle with an ev has me leaning even more where i don't know if you'd asked me a couple years ago we were holding off and waiting to see what tesla would eventually do with a model 2 Mm -hmm. And now there's been no word on that, except for Elon Musk saying, Reuters is lying. And this is the thing that really sours the emotional perception of the brand for someone like me. I know what it's like working with journalists. And I know that sometimes journalists can be kind of poopy and you don't want to play that game. But you're not a serious person if, a, if an outlet like Reuters reaches out for a comment and you refuse to give them a comment, and then you go scurrying off to go, no, uh on Twitter. You're not a serious person. And I want a serious person to kind of bring Tesla back mm -hmm. and start focusing them in the direction that made me so excited about Tesla when we saw that first Roadster. And we saw an EV do something we never thought 
EVs could do. No, no, absolutely. And I think th this is where you see the potential. I mean, again, it, but this is this is just his, his stick. Seriously, I mean, it, if you'd expected anything different from from Elon at this point, <laughs> jumping into X, yeah, trying to put a comment there. I would have been more surprised there, but once he, you know, going up there and, and the reality is he wants to feel like he's, he's controlling the conversation. He's able to break news on things. And then, and then they break in again, August, early August, we'll find out what the robo taxi is going to be. I'm like, okay, great. Again, welcome to the game that's been out for some time. It, it, it feels weird having to say that Tesla's catching up, but we'll have to see how, yeah. how it approaches. Uh, I, I'll, I'll say that with everything that's been going on with their cars, with the latest upgrade, their latest full self-driving, if there's any indication of where this thing is, it is no longer in the learning phase. It is in the implementation phase. Their model has developed to the point where they're actually running native code on the actual system, and it has improved quite a bit. Like the last update that's that good. they pushed, uh, having used um, auto steer on, on surface road, uh, and I was like, this is crazy good. This actually drives like a regular good. person right now. Like I showed it to my wife. She's like, this was a good turn. I'm like, it's getting better. But again, that whole gatekeeping thing, it, it's an expensive yeah. uh, addition. Do you feel like it's worth 12K so you can have the car drive while you're still, you know, monitoring it and holding the steering wheel? Not really. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> I'll say it, it, it just, it just, it's not there yet. That, that ooh, ah kind of thing dies right away when you say 12K. The moment you say yeah. 12K, you're like, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, 12K on top of an already oh, premium. On top of them already. Yeah, and, and yeah, 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 for sure. It's even a worse decision. Like I did it. Just don't do that again. Um, <laughs> because then you're paying financing <laughs> oh, fees on, on a, oh, on a buddy. It wasn't 12K when I got it, but it was still expensive. And yeah. I got lucky where I was able to transfer it to my new car. And that was the only reason I was willing to do a transfer gotcha. and, and move on. Because it, I get to transfer my full self-driving. Because if I didn't, that that's a loss. And, and companies now are not even valuing full self-driving when you trade it in. If you try to go to CarMax, they discounted the whole thing. They're like, you can subscribe to this thing. There's no reason to get a feature for it. It's like, okay, peace. I'm with you. Yeah. Great. Cool. Yeah. That, thanks. Thanks, CarMax, but <laughs> not. So I, I, I hope that we'll see. My hope yeah. is that RoboTaxi is a reveal for Model 2. Model 2 becomes a fleet vehicle mm -hmm. that you see it like a uh, um, car rental uh, places, or maybe they've got a partnership with Lyft or something like that. I'm still holding out some hope mm -hmm. that I know they've put money and design time and R and D into a smaller car. And especially after what we saw from Rivian, like I want to see little punchy roadworthy hatchbacky kinds of cars. And for EVs, that is so much more exciting, lower weight, better performance, better so, battery range, all that fun stuff. I'll, I'll so say I'm hoping that in August we'll see some kind of admission that, no, we're not scrapping Model 2, but we're focusing on this, and then Model 2 will come out. Because that, to me, is also a very Tesla story, yeah. is not meeting their own deadlines. Yeah. <laughs> so just push the deadline, no, but no, don't tell me that the car is canceled. Literally, literally what they're dealing with right now with the end of Q1 and... Uh, the only thing I'll, I'll, I'll throw in one last piece just for reference is they do make a modified version of Model Y. I forgot for what state where they allow you to remove yeah. the rear seats to make it more of a trunk, much bigger trunk mm -hmm. configuration. But that's not the solution. I just want to make sure if anybody's listening or, or we're watching the show later on, we're, we're very much aware of that modified model, model sure. Y, but it's still an SUV. So it's not a hatchback. So yeah. yeah. And especially with the price fluctuations on Model Y. So um, yeah. again, what we'll, we'll, we'll apparently we'll get actual news in August and Tesla couldn't be bothered to comment to a reputable news agency about internal reports on them scrapping. I hope they haven't scrapped the Model 2. I, I, don't, um, yeah, I, I really doubt it. I think it's really more of maybe postponed, but yeah, it makes no sense. There's too much competition. I, I Yeah. Oh, it, yeah, for sure. So um, in, in moving on to our next story here, we've got two more uh, uh, actual proper links here. Uh, TK, you and I, we need to pat ourselves on the back to the point of dislocating our shoulders. Because I want to say it was at the beginning of the year mm -hmm. on the Best of Our Week podcast where we were talking about um, AI announcements and, you know, like Samsung was going all in on AI and Pixel, the cloud editor was doing all of this funky stuff where you could move people around in your shot. Mm -hmm. And we said it will happen incredibly soon. 
that confidence in cell phone gathered evidence is immediately going to be questioned yep. and, and probably thrown out. And wouldn't you know it, we said by the end of 2024, we expected to see some case where cell phone generated evidence was dismissed. We only barely to- made it to the first third of the year before that happened. And uh, uh, let me yeah. pull this up here. Actually, can I swap us back? Yeah, okay. So oh, wow. I okay. wish it would just remember so that we could stay in this format. Okay. So this is a story written up by PC Magazine. I'm going to make the headline just a little our, bit our, our old buddy, Joe Hindi. Joe. Yep. Yeah, Joe I'll wrote this up. Buddy. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, Joe Hindi, judge throws out at video evidence in murder case over AI enhancements. This was for me, once we started seeing in photography where, you know, you can select a person, you can move them around in the frame, content aware fill is going to fill in the background. It's going to make it look like something totally different. The second I saw Google presenting that, I immediately, immediately thought this is going to um, degrade the confidence in every photo and video that has ever been used as evidence in a court case. And now we're only into April. King County Superior Court Judge Leroy McCullough in Washington State moves to avoid a time-consuming trial within a trial about the use of AI. Instead of trying to have lawyers argue the veracity of the data, he's cutting it out. He's dismissing it. He's chucking that evidence. And now this is setting... Uh, it's not a critical precedent, but this is setting a behavior for judges to follow in the future. Mm-hmm. I don't want to have the defense and the uh, the state arguing over whether or not this is real. I don't want my jury confused as they talk about what's an HDR processing stack of DNG files versus manipulation of the data in the frame. We're just going to get rid of it. And this immediately, immediately degrades any future evidence. You're like, oh no, something bad is happening. Let me get my phone out. Let me shoot this with the camera. Unless we've got multiple perspectives and we have multiple streams of data that we can uh, corroborate one person's perspective, the idea that just one person snapping a photo or one person snapping a video has now been destroyed for future court cases. We do not trust this data now. And I'm very frustrated with, um, and this isn't unique to Google, I'm very frustrated with the entire AI industry rushing us into this, delivering tools without good um w- w- source, without source, good ver- verification source data information without good now, yes thank no, you no no exactly it's 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 um the the challenge that's going on with with many things is the reality is you just don't know what the original content was and when you yes. are able to question that like you know samsung puts a little bit of that little uh, that little logo on the bottom left whenever you edit it <laughs> That's one way of doing sure. it but the reality is not everything no, hold on it. hold on i just i just want to point out you know what's really funny about that it's so Samsung will put the put the little logo, and then all you have to do is go back into Samsung's editor and mm-hmm. do a magic erase style or magic eraser style edit, and you can get rid of the logo. Uh, no, no, no. I, it, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> they they tried to put that in there, but even that doesn't really generally validate or at least tell us that this is an original image. Um, content capture and content manipulation it almost happens instantaneously to a certain point. Yeah. Some apps have AI functions that enhance colors, that boost images, and do a whole sure. bunch of things. We've had them for many years, and if the color of an item is a, a deciding factor, can you question it? Can you question it and, and basically get that thrown out just because it doesn't favor your side of the conversation and use this ruling on it? it it's a hard conversation to, to put out. How do we monitor? How do we manage manipulated data where we now have such easy access to it again i talked about chat gpt being on on glasses how do you know yeah. i didn't just i i came up with this all the information i have or that i just happened to chat gpt real quick and i got like all these beautiful <laughs> smart bullet right. point topics about something i had no idea what i was talking about Th- there's there's an ago. authenticity yeah. that now is calling into question a lot of our um, a lot of our media, but then also just a lot of those kinds of interactions. And it's tough to say, you know, like I, I remember being in a conversation with a bunch of techies. I mean, this was like in the 3G era 
And just like, hey, yeah, it used to be fun. You'd have like an argument in a bar and then you'd be like, oh, I guess we'll never know. And now it's like the second you have this kind of confrontation, I know this and you know that and you're wrong and you're right, someone's immediately on Google and it takes some of the fun out of that drunken argument you used to have at 2 a.m. as to who was in what movie in this Western or something like that. And so even more so now, while we've got this information and while we've got these tools at our fingertips, it's... It, 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 there's a social aspect of it that I think is definitely precious and we need to, to chat about it. But now this is directly walking us into really scary territory mm -hmm. on how do we, how do we present a case? How do we verify information? What organizations are going to be responsible for delivering better tools that we'll actually trust and that we'll, we'll use? And, and it seems like we're, we're kind of two steps past the confidence of general users now. There's like an apathy of like, oh, I guess everything's fake and fake news. Well, we We've already, already have decimated. We have, we have that in the in the uh, in the modeling industry. We already have it. Understandable that you know everything is touched up, everything is airbrushed. We've used those terms before, and I think they've questioned those before, and they've had conversations. But now it's it's leaving that conversation into because of the AI functions into general mm -hmm. tech. Like that that was that used to be segregated into that just specific medium, you know, mean modeling and so. On, and it really only happened there, but there were still real life, real images, real videos yeah. happening out there. But yeah, now you're like almost like, hold on a second, I got to take this picture. We're seeing this really weird thing. But do you mind shooting it too? So we have two streams yeah. of this thing. It's like you have to think about it just to make so sure. In the middle of a catastrophe or like a, a shooter situation, um, what I need you to do, TK, I mean, I know we're getting shot at right now, Absolutely. but go into your phone's pro mode. Your phone camera pro mode. Oh, well, that bullet almost got me. Um, go into your phone camera pro mode and switch on the raw capture. Um, oh no, TK's been shot. <laughs> Darn, we were so close to getting two two perspective well, verified that would raw have been the data. Point where you grabbed ah. my phone and you took the picture with the you took the video and see. But the second the second I handle it though, now it calls into question my motives for yes. capturing. On I've always wondered devices, about your motives. So. Realistically, we're going to be honest with each other. Think, we're going to have this podcast. The motives have always been questioned. I think everybody should. Yes. What are Juan's motives? He seems like a shifty character, if you ask me. A lot of questions and answers. I don't a know. A lot man. of questions. A lot of QA. A lot of QA. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, we we were entirely correct. We were completely on the pulse. And Sadly, I don't know least. what fixes this except for some type of consortium body of verifying a standard. So um like camera manufacturers, print. yeah, like a digital finger camera print. camera manufacturers are trying to create something that bakes into the photo you capture um, some type of verification that this was the original unaltered photo. And as soon as you edit it, then it removes this information from the metadata. Obviously, that's also not going to be a perfect solution to start, but we still, it still, I think the thing that bothers me and, and, and uh, where I'd love to hear some of your thoughts too, the thing that bothers me is sort of a techie apathy. I think consumers care about the authenticity of images and they care about the authenticity of news and they care about uh, evidence in court, but they're burnt out and they're exhausted and they're not digging into the nuts and bolts of this stuff like we are. But then you go and talk to techies and there's this kind of shrug, I guess everything's going to suck. Oh, well. And I disagree. Like, it doesn't mean that you just let it happen. It means no, you no, no. push back exactly. and you try to find something that can correct some part of this. And hopefully we come out the other side with some trust again in what these cameras capture. So, something along the line of what we've seen with AI generated text and how teachers have been able to manage some of these conversations. Cause we saw this already, right? We saw it again, referencing like chat PPT, uh, Gemini, Bard, all of these you know LLMs that we see there that are able to learn and adapt and create content on their own based on cues are, are a big, concern for teachers and obviously uh, scholars and news articles and so on. Is this produced by a person? Is this produced by uh, basically, a, 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 again, a, a, uh, an AI tool? And they, they tried to create validation tools to be able to run through and see, hey, can we validate that this is written by a person or this is run by an AI? 
Um, did it make it more where people had to kind of go through a few hoops to try to cheat that system? I'm not going to say it's perfect. But as you said, baking in some type of a digital ID, something that our smartphones, our cameras, our any kind of content capture type mm -hmm. of a solution, and be having that in and retrofitting it into the existing hardware that we have on the market via software update or some kind of a firmware update. Hopefully, that's possible. I'll, I'll say that mm -hmm. the same way it's able to embed, uh, you know, time and date and all of that information, adding a certain digital signature in there, even if it is text. And that, as you said yourself, allow making it so that editors are no longer allowing us to save that data again once edited. So if you take the raw yeah. file, you modify it. Now it just becomes another file on your system, has a new creation date, new modification date, but it keeps the original intact, will help to a certain point, but it's going to be hard because, again, when there's yeah. a will, there's a way. People want to cheat, they're going exactly. to cheat. Uh, it, it's, it's not hard, but at least re, it tries to rebuild the confidence level that we may be potentially going down that slippery slope. Is it going to be the same way with every case that every judge looks at it and questions? It's not like there's a there's a sheet when you're submitting images. Judge, these are the images I submitted from this crime scene and they were digitally modified. Just want you to know, these are the original and that you're like, not submitting them in that category. <laughs> right. Right? I'm, I'm questioning a little bit of how was the judge made aware that this was AI enhanced and why was it submitted in if it was AI enhanced? Like why was that like the, the defense or the prosecution thinking this mm. makes sense. I think I think this is an incredible win for the defense in this oh. specific case. Yeah, because that was probably photography and video evidence that was unflattering to their client. And instead of debating the merits of the evidence, they exhausted the judge to a point where didn't want to focus on it for this I, part. I, of the I don't trial, want to so deal with this it. for yeah. I don't want to have days yeah. of us sitting here just like it's modified. No, it's not. It's not modified. No, yeah. Well, and I think it speaks to the same thing we've been talking about for years. Yep. Even in techie circles, there is a shocking undereducation on what our gadgets really do. Mm -hmm. We chalk it up to a Geekbench score, and do you see pretty colors with the HDR processing? And that's what counts for a review. That is not a review. That is a reading of specs to pretty B-roll. And if we were doing a good job of keeping techies better up to date on yep. the actual nuts and bolts and mechanics of this stuff, then we would have at least some group of enthusiasts that would be kind of parsing some of this information on to family and friends, and our legal system wouldn't be completely unprepared. It'd be mostly unprepared, but not completely unprepared for what was coming down the pipe. John Gao actually gave us, a, uh, popped in a little comment in chat. I could not remember the abbreviation C2PA is one of these standards bodies. And I think Sony is a major contributor to C2PA. But as far as I know, their focus is primarily on mirrorless cameras. And what we need is fast. We need some type of standard or original content tag for cell phones. Yep. That to me is the biggest issue. I, I, the most I regularly- The of cameras on the, in the world is- In the world today. Exactly. And I, and I regularly, practice what I preach. I believe the cell phone is one of the most uh, dynamic and disruptive tools for journalism. Mm -hmm. Except if you can't trust the images coming out of it, then that is not going to increase journalistic integrity. That is not going to improve confidence that when a reporter is out on a location and they pull out their phone to get some type of footage, and then people are going to look at these types of court cases and say, oh, but fake news. Oh, it's obviously a biased reporter because they used their phone, which does AI. Because consumers have no idea what they're talking about. It's such when a, they say a, 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 it does AI. Yeah, exactly. You know, like it, it, it doesn't mean it, anything. It's like the five Gs and the four Gs and the the, the Gs and yeah. all the Gs. It's such an ominous term that is so misused. Oh, not only just that, misused to many, many like the word pro. We've butchered that, <laughs> that, that terminology yeah. to, to the ground that the Spot word ultra on. is needed, right? AI is coming down that road because we use this whole smart AI all over mm -hmm. the place and very few things are truly smart or AI enabled. So it is a very much a loose term. And again, it creates that omni cloud of a, of a, you know, presence of certain things and people will attribute anything they don't understand to it. To, and to the they, AI. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they'll shun it based on that primarily factor. Don't get me wrong. The judge, I, I'm not, I'm not questioning the judge decision. I'm, I'm more so 
I will say this, had it been more of a tech forward uh, judge that may have been more versed into what those AI functions that they were referring to, they may have steered the conversation in a slightly different direction. But is that something that everybody's jumping on and taking an AI course? No, we're all learning it. And we're, I mean, we have devices now, we have like uh, devices that sit on your chest, portable devices, smart watches, smart mm -hmm. classes, AI's permeating into everything and we need to get a handle on how that conversation is managed because if we don't it's just going to create more distrust and more questions and easy yeah. ways of just you and know throwing shit uh, you know uh, suspicious I, I do want us to take just a, a small step back one we got a really funny comment from from barry johnson uh they were only mostly unprepared which is not indeed mostly dead i wonder if miracle max could solve another miracle so i in my own tech glee mm -hmm. I should kick my own butt here because the case that this is being reported on is actually kind of a big deal. Um, the smartphone okay. video in question was taken during a shooting in a Seattle area bar that killed three people and wounded two. The defendant, Joshua Polaka, hmm? okay. uh, the defendant claims self-defense. His lawyers hired a man with a background in creative video production and editing who used software from Topaz Labs to enhance the video. But prosecutors argue the changes made the video inaccurate, misleading, and unreliable. So I was mistaken. This was actually not a win for the defense. This was a this win was, for This is a win for the prosecutors sure, yeah. because AI enhancement of light and color is what we see in terrible late 90s sci-fi tv shows i was, about, I was, and I was just about to say literally that's literally what the actual captain will say or i or even uh in csi right like he's yeah, just like enhance enhance Enha can you zoom in and enhance so, enhance, enhance so right there enhance, like what yeah our then, ability to educate a judge and a jury i mean we're starting from scratch trying to tell them hey so a movie is a series of moving pictures and exposure is how bright or dark each of those moving pictures are. And after the picture has been captured, they can be brightened, but that doesn't change any of the it information in the, it uh, like things into the conversation. Yeah. Or it takes, things I, away. I, we, we can sit through that conversation. If I had literally just said exactly what I said to my, to one of my aunts. I know exactly the woman. She is a lovely woman. But if I had started saying that, I know for a fact that by the time I was done with the first sentence about moving images, her eyes would have glazed over. Like that's not her, that's not her thing. That's not her bag. She doesn't care about that kind of stuff. Now try and get a jury over that hurdle. I, I understand why the judge made the call he made, but I think this is going to be a terrible outcome for the future of other trials. And this is a big deal. And we're talking about multiple shootings, multiple deaths in this altercation. If we can't trust the night vision of a security camera because it uses an IR lamp, which enhances the lighting of the scene. Oh, it's a dark scene. Shouldn't the video be dark? Why is it bright? Oh, it must be AI. We're screwed. <laughs> I, it, 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 like I said, it, it, part of it is is... To, to a certain point, it benefits one side of the conversation, but again, it is it is going to be very much rooted into understanding and education. It, it's it's understanding what you're looking at and not shunning it to a certain point, and everything is fake, and not yeah. going to the other camp of like I just don't understand how they did it. No, as as a, <laughs> as we make decisions in life to pick certain things and not other things, like I like this uh, this you know this uh, this computer because of this X Y Z. I like this car. Well, we know we understand tech. We make decisions on tech on a daily basis, but it, there's a a certain level of education that takes time and i think ai in its current form with the wild west of what the term ai is being used it, it's hard and and it's it's uh you know understanding that again it, what they did was not enhancement it was not ai to it to what ai can truly do um and throwing it out again just shows that i think the, the judge just didn't want the argument to be going in or at least and I think I think it's so this is why I'm disappointed is because I feel like the argument still would have contributed to the discussion of this case and the claims mm -hmm. being made by the defendant that even if we were to say, let's say they use Topaz not to enhance lighting, but to up res the video to make things more clear. 
that is still necessary courtroom conversation, and maybe yeah. that's a little more objectionable. Maybe that, that we're one, making up details and, and pixels that didn't exist. Yeah. But that's still information in the courtroom that helps us set legal precedent mm -hmm. for future court cases, not just dismissing the evidence. We actually want to know what to do with this evidence, and I exactly. wish this judge had the fortitude to at least broach part of that conversation or a bit more of this conversation in open deliberation. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, too, I still kind of wonder also, maybe a little, I'll read up on that a little bit more as to how did the, how, how this, how this piece of tech or this piece of uh, evidence would have swayed the conversation one way or another. Did it really drive the conversation in one way or another? Or is that why they, they, they dismissed it? They didn't feel like it was a strong enough or it would have brought too much ambiguity to the conversation or was mm -hmm. it just, again, there's like, a lot more information other than did the, this the, really make the defense's case exactly like or did it yeah it was it was there just enough to be able to have the conversation this was just not really needed because it would have just added too much it, again too too many arguments too many things going on and not really contributed to the end of the conversation we have enough to not have not need it and or are we just looking again because there's a it's an article the title is very specific and it's gearing us down to one one area but I assure you that the case is not based on one video. If it is, then it's, there's a, I'm sure there's a lot more eyewitness and, and things that they're able to kind of uh, talk about. And this is a conversation piece, or at least a piece of tech that they're able to go for. We need to go. So back we got to Michael Pepper tech is, I guess he's correct. We just need to go back to film oh, yeah. because there's no way to alter the output of my a film, like change the exposure or no. add colors that oh didn't my God. exist. Yeah, go back, or, just have gotta... the camera guy with the whole, just have him just sit there. Okay, we're capturing, keep, okay. <laughs> Are, is this the CCTV? I'm gonna be doing this during again. Okay, I'll be taking videos down. <laughs> It's like, I'm so happy you did that too, because um, I just watched an old movie, uh, Shadow of the Vampire, I okay. think is what it's called. Oh God, I can't remember. It's basically um, a, a horror film that uh, it tells the story of the filming of Nosferatu, the okay. original silent film. But it's the, the, the gag is that the Nosferatu was, was real. And what you see in the footage from the original film is actually like a real life vampire. Like they're actually, and, yeah, they're, they're capturing. It's, 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 it's a so movie about right. making the movie, about it being real, not fake. And again, it's, it's just so charming to see all those hand cranked, like, 12 to 16 frame per second film cameras it, the, like it's, the perception it's adorable of how to shoot a video has changed over the years or even how to pick up a call <laughs> right like i see those memes or, or those tiktoks and stuff like that they're like you know how do you pick up a call i'm like what how do you make a phone call nobody does that no, like I, I, yeah. i'll say I'm, I'm lucky enough that my son knows what a dial tone what a what a just a standard dialing phone is because i've shown him the original rotary phone he's like how do you dial mm -hmm. that and it's like you spin it there's magic in the spin and you're able to hold the last one so that you can dial just at the moment you want, because if you don't release the last one, it just doesn't dial. It doesn't, so, it yeah, doesn't and, go. Yeah. And I mean, we saw some really cool tech to it at Qualcomm headquarters, man. We saw the suitcase yeah. phones. We saw the original Nexus, the G1 and some of the original, like just communication pieces. It's, it's, it's amazing how tech We've has come evolved. a long way. It is. Yeah. Happily. I'm happy to say I could not have imagined today when I was five or when I was 10, I told my wife yesterday uh, over the weekend, I said, never in my life, if you had talked to me when I was 10, I would say, I'd, I'd be driving in an electric car oh, yeah. down the freeway and my kid's in the back and he's listening to something. I like he's again, uh, a lot of cool things. Tech is helping. A lot of cool stuff. Yeah. I, I always thought like when I was growing up, I mean, I, I was that nerd in the sixth grade who had a TI uh Pocket organizer the TI, had a yeah, full the, the TI no, not, not a graphing calculator. Oh, you it was, it was it was it was a it no it was after the TI eighty uh, two they had ca graphing calculators out but this was a pocket organizer okay. that had sixty four k of storage and that you would good, you I, I would punch out little memos and like my school notes and stuff like that and everyone made fun of me. And I went on to PDAs, and I was a huge fan of Palm Pilots and Windows Mobile devices. I, and I everyone thought you were like, talking about public why section, but that's fine. Why do you even need a computer? Who cares about their email that much? Blah, 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 blah. And then, of course, everything kind of took over. But if you would ask me, especially back then, I, I was always going to be that nerd mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. that I'd have a friend or two at the lunchroom table who would think this stuff was cool and then everyone else would make fun of me for it. Um, I always thought I had, that would no, be my I, whole I life. I had my own gr group of nerdy nerds uh, that, I mean, I still <laughs> hang out with one of them. I, we're still good friends. The, he, the main man that introduced me to PC building and, uh, yeah. and just, just overall modding and all of that. No, there is a, I mean, yes, we, we, we appreciated tech back then. We didn't see how or where it could get. Like, I mean, we knew it was smart. We knew the the form factor of a PC in oh, yeah. uh, ninety two or ninety three that you know, would sit on your desk with this massive display was already light years you know beyond what we originally had with these massive rooms that we used to be the computing power. And the fact that now we have them sitting in our pocket, like like this beautiful thing that not only is a phone. But he's a tablet. But it's a tablet, yeah. And, and like, a great camera and, and a great phone. media device and, and a great phone in your hand. And it just works. Like, again, technology. Thank you. But just, now, I you just know. want to point out, because Dave Burns is making fun of me here. He says, quote, look, I have the pocket organizer so I can save all my friends' info. Now I just need friends. Juan Carlos Bagnow, class of 1978. I would just like to point out, <laughs> 1978 was before I was born. So I'm old. <laughs> not before I was but born, I'm not, but I understand. I'm not that old. <laughs> he, he, no, no, I see what he's doing. He's, 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 he's ricocheting the joke from you, landing <laughs> it on me. I get it. I take it. I dodged back. so that you would get hit. <laughs> I jumped out of the way just so that you would get his, rocked. His gray so, hairs are showing very much where I'm coming from. So yes, speaking of. All of the tech that we weren't expecting, and and I think like for 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 cats like you and me, yeah. I think we expected a lot of really cool tech in progress. I just mm -hmm. was completely blown away by the consumer response and how uh, dominant this um, tech yeah. has become. Um, I want to wrap up. Uh, I, I we, we've gone kind of like long. We've got about fifteen minutes here. We sure. don't need to spend a ton of time on this, but Double I want to wrap up with a headline that really took me by surprise. Okay and is a little concerning when we consider the reputation that Apple has worked so hard to create, it feels like we're starting to see more behind the scenes and more actual operation from Apple, which suggests a lack of executive leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm gonna throw this back up here on the screen. I've gotta go through and Re nope, that's not what I wanted to do. How did I make that happen before? Ah, there it goes. Yep. Nope, there. So okay. this is an article written up over at Business Insider by Aaron Mock. Apple has been secretly building home robots that could end up as a new product line, report says. Um, Apple's in the early stages of looking into making home robots a move that appears to be an effort to create its, quote, next big thing after it killed its self-driving car project earlier this year, sources familiar with the matter told Bloomberg. So um, here's the thing. I am hypercritical of Apple. I feel they've been overdue, mm -hmm. uh, more regulatory scrutiny and a market correction, sort of a perception correction with consumers. Okay. Uh, Vision Pro is a product that was 12 years in the pipeline. They got a runway of over a decade to eventually release a nice developer kit for a mixed reality headset. We know that they spent 10 years playing with car tech, and it seems like internally they're walking away from billions of dollars of investment there. The last big disruptive product that I think really rocked and rocked for consumers was the Apple Watch. Mm -hmm. And I think the last mainstream consumer product that has really um, elevated Apple's position is M series chips. Yes. So, so the MacBooks. Th this has helped spur on competition. It's not. This has completely revolutionized laptops. I mean, mm -hmm. Windows laptops still out sell out MacBooks like what seven to three, but it at least encouraged some exciting growth and some disruption in that market. I none of those are iPhone disruption. Right, what Apple did to completely change the portable computing market, destroyed the BlackBerry, wrecked Windows Mobile, all of that stuff. Apple is looking for this next big thing. TK Bay, who owns a MacBook, do you think home robots are going to be the next big disruptive profit motivating sector for Apple? I, I, I'm, ah. Uh... 
Okay, look, the 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 home robotics department right now as it exists, right? It, it's limited pretty much to vacuums and a couple of quirky little dogs or pool something. cleaners. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, don't knock it till you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't have a point. I was saying, the no, at some point, we'll need to do a podcast of just reading off the inordinate number of PR emails we get on pool cleaners. Oh my god! Because I know you have to be getting hit with I, as many or more um, as I am. I've I've had a few. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love and it says in the bond, <laughs> you must have a pool. I'm like, I don't have a pool. I don't. I don't have a pool. I know. I know. It's surprising. People in California, not everybody got a pool. It Please take out. me off this list. <laughs> I, don't I cannot know how I help qualify. you. Or, or, or for me, at least, the number one is the cosmetic line with the hair dryers. I got to be taken off that list. I, I don't have yeah. a long enough beard for hair dryers. No. Nope. Um, look, uh, the ecosystem it, theory hasn't been a massive demand in home robotics. The, the the development that's been going on with vacuums has been amazing. We've seen a, a massive leap from the original, uh, you know, Roomba to where we are now and what we're able to do. Again, absolutely great. I don't think Apple's jumping into creating an iRobot or an iPet or whatever they're going to call it if it ends up being that set. Uh, and when we're talking about robotics, there's so many things that could it could be. It could be automation functions. It could be things that feed into the Apple, uh, you know, the HomeKit or even using uh, something relating to HomePod. Again, very, very much a, an, an ambiguous type of a term to just say home robotics. Um, it's it's a it's a functional thing that Apple's been doing. They've succeeded in mobile tech. Their major successes over the last how many years since their inception have been mobile tech. HomePod is not flying off the shelves because it's the best speaker ever. It just very few people buy them. Most Apple, I think their, their biggest competition would be Alexa because those are more functional yeah. and it works with an ecosystem people like to use. I don't think Apple is going to be ushering in a new ecosystem, uh, a new, oh my God, this innovation level. And we're all going to jump on it because we seem to be missing this. There's this massive void of tech in our home, especially in the robotics section. I think this is more so maybe feeding into some of their other e existing, e uh, again, I feel like it's really more towards automation, functional options, accessories around the house that will help them connect so better too. to their devices. But it is technically under robotics because it technically includes uh, servos. Well, uh, different yeah, options and I mean, other. like that—that's that, yeah. where I think a lot of us are going to think first of a company like iRobot and yeah. robot vacuums, and exactly. we're going to kind of smirk and say, "Well, if Apple now limps into this space, it's not like we haven't had robot vacuums forever. What no, are they going to do?" Tony, different? Tony's made multiple generations of their uh, home dogs, uh, their, their pets for for the home. Sure. And and we've seen other. I think um, uh, Mr. Fisher, Michael Fisher, reviewed. I think one of the earlier generation, the the moving ones with the display, right? Like yeah. there's been many little assisting pets or I, type of solutions. I think we could see something like an iPad gimbal. Could so be. let's say you've got a little desktop arm, like I've got my monitors on desktop arms. You don't yeah. need a ton of beefy hardware to move around an iPad. No. And you could make that very mag safey. You pop it on in the middle of a FaceTime call. It's the arm is going to track my position just like my camera software does for the podcast and moves the view yeah. around. It's it's great for FaceTiming. And now, hey, if you a friend of yours is on Vision Pro and they're moving around and you don't want to get a Vision Pro, but you've got an iPad, you could be moving around. And I think that's I think that's totally plausible, and I bet you Apple has been doing a ton of work behind the scenes and making yeah, yeah. products like it for the home. The, the I just also don't see when it says secretly building. It's like what company publicly builds anything? I know. <laughs> when when did that become a public? Like you know, well, I like, mean, we are talking about Business Insider, so business say, cats. There is no live stream going on. You know, no. at, at the Apple headquarters. <laughs> Here at phone. Apple, we're Here. doing this secretly, publicly. No. I don't know. Sorry, the, the title is. I loved how it was. No, it, worded, it's 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 yeah, the clickbaitiness yeah. of it. But <laughs> it but to me, using the word "secret," that's what they wanted. Yeah, I don't see a future in making expensive accessories that complement Apple's current ecosystem, but are techy cool, like having robot arms in the house. Do you know what I mean? Like. I totally believe Apple is probably working on stuff like that. Oh, of course. I Their don't ID see where consumers are going to rush out. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is, we are, okay, let's, let's step back. We, we all remember the Jetsons. We all remember uh, <laughs> that we all thought we would be driving flying cars and we'd have robot maids by now. And, yep. and, and the reality is, is it, 
is I don't think that's the tech we're talking about. We are not talking about building autonomous robots in, you know, um, uh, it, I mean, heck, I think I think Xiaomi and Tesla are ahead, light years ahead on, on, on Apple's side, yeah. unless Apple's made some massive, uh, you know, breakthrough in there. Um, I, I've actually seen full bodied robots from Xiaomi at MWC, not even this mm -hmm. year, the year before. It isn't, this is not new. And we've seen, um, you know, other solutions showing, you know, their robots and so on. The reality is, is that going to be something in the future? I'm not going to say no. I'm, I'm going to be very honest with you. There is still a very small part of me as a kid that wanted the Jetsons to be here now. Um, yeah. But Same. we are not there, and I don't think we are there in the next five, ten years even. This is something that, that not only will take a lot of just to build, to set up, but also to get people to be comfortable with. There's the comfort level yeah. of... You know, um, like the iPhone came out and it was an ing it was an ingenious uh, product, but it built on the iPod. It was built on something that was originally accepted by people carrying a small device with you to listen to music. And it was leveraged yeah. as an iPod with an internet connection. So it was an enhancement. Again, bring, bring over the iPad. The first generation iPad sold, but it was very limited in what we have back then and what we have now. We sure. have now M series in there. Apple is definitely in in good company when it comes to this. They are a little bit behind into this if they do want to go into the bigger things. But this is way down the road. What we're more likely, like you said, it's yeah. home automation, uh, machines, uh, things that help, uh, I guess, improve our life, but not necessarily make it such a, a critical part of it. And and again, I still want to get I, I that know. robot made. I'm, I'm waiting for that one. I, I do. I, I like, and now. again, if, 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 if the... I think if the rumors were pointing to like Apple's robot butler, right? Yeah. Siri now has a physical form. The eye butler. Something like that. Oh, yeah, man. the eye butler. Just, I can see the joke there. The eye butt. <laughs> uh, but um, Sorry. but so I, I mean something like that that maybe sparks some of the imagination. Because again, for so many consumers when the iPhone came out. The idea of a data connected phone was a techie, nerdy, geeky thing that no Very one yeah. really wanted except for nerds like us. And when Steve Jobs was out on stage saying, iPod, telephone, web connected device, are you getting it? And it was that simple that it was just those three things in one shell and it got a lot of people excited. I don't think we live in an era where you can come out with home automation goods that spark excitement in com in consumers and kind of like we how we were talking about Tesla recently and sort yeah. of the 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 mixed reactions to the to the Cybertruck now we've you're so excited you're going to be so excited HomePod is going to revolutionize Bluetooth audio it didn't do that at all you're going to be so excited Vision Pro is a product that has been 12 years in the in that didn't that didn't become that, that shows how the exciting yeah, when you're so late thing. to the game that the game is finally catching up to you. Apple can't right. just sit on its lorry and then just basically say, "Well, we can invent wi wireless, or we're going to invent AI at some point." I, I mean, so like, let let's say it's like what I was describing, and it's yeah. something that you can take your FaceTime calls on. I also have a little Canon motorized camera here that tracks my face. Yeah, like this is the thing that you, like. I haven't even done a video or review on this because it's kind of just such an ordinary idea now that if you've got NVIDIA software on your GPU, you can do face tracking. If you've got a Motorola phone, you could do your, your selfie camera your, does yeah, face yeah, tracking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want hardware, we've got a bunch of these little cameras out that do face tracking. I don't, I don't see where Apple... And again, I am absolutely my admitting. My sitting on the top of my monitor right there has been doing face tracking for many years. I can actually gesture to it, gesture support, sure. not just face tracking. I can, I can sign to my thing. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. So, Sorry. so I will, I will absolutely admit that I am showing a lack of imagination here, and I'm not really trying to help Apple in any regard in this conversation. Well, but yeah, I don't see where Apple comes up with the next big thing out of robotics. I just don't see it. I, I, I see where they, they they're going to doing that. The Apple Apple's main shtick isn't is no longer innovation. It is leveraging years of development stuff of that generation. already exists that, no, no, absolutely. and plugging it into their ecosystem. Since the iPad and the Apple, even I'll, I'll say this: Look, Apple Watch was not 
it is revolutionary for iPhone for iPhone users. Absolutely. Is it the best mm -hmm. smartwatch on the market? No. Have there been more smartwatches prior to it? Absolutely. Yes. Was sure. it the Wild West back then? I don't disagree. But whenever we see Apple come up with a product, it's always been based on an existing product that's already been out or the idea of a product that's already been out and they augment or enhance it. We have not seen them. This not the again, Vision Pro is not groundbreaking in the way Apple sells it. And it is by, as you said before, it is a development kit. It's a dev kit. And we need to stop referring to it as a product. It as was a not intended. Product. Yeah, no, it is. It was never intended for all of us to take them and say, say, well, no, it's designed for a developer that's sitting in an office or sitting in a, in a studio, whatever they're working, and they're supposed to write code for it, test it out and use it. And we're getting people trying to use them for like 24 hours a day and living with them and going out and doing a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff. Again, not the intention of the product. It's like, right. Read the label. That's and, all I would say. And and I feel Apple has been sort of overselling their position in a lot of that tech. I mean, so like Michael, Michael Pepper Tech is bringing up some great points. Sure. You know, like they've been using robots for disassembling old iPhones and reusing parts. Maybe this is just more of that. That's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about here. We're talking about consumer facing experiences and the next phase of Apple selling and making money. I mean, make, it's business it, yeah, insider. It's, it's the not. Home. It's the home. It's it, the it, next. It's, it's the next frontier for most tech products yeah. right now, because. We they've had we have a good grasp on you know mobile tech and our smartphones cameras we have good good a lot of tech in our in our cars even before we had uh, sure. electric cars we had way more tech than we had in the past so it's not you know they, and there's already two big players there MediaTek and Qualcomm are already playing very heavily into that and mm -hmm. and Apple jumping into the conversation right now would be too far like that very much of an uphill battle for them. The home is where things have basically been somewhat to a certain point stagnant. We've had automation to a certain point. We've had mm -hmm. some smart options as far as, you know, mopping and, and uh, spatial awareness using lasers and, and, and all of that stuff. Yeah. Again, but it's limited to vacuums. This is why this makes, makes sense of why they're looking at it. It's hard, though, because whatever you decide to come up with has to be so groundbreaking that people just like, oh, my God, take my money now. And yeah. it's hard, even with the stuff, like even with the last few hits, it's hard to get that wow factor. People are, it's, again, yeah, it's hard. I'll, I'll, I think I'll we've, we've I mean, this isn't unique to Apple either. I think no, we've no, no, no. oversold it, smart exactly. home to a lot of consumers and consumers go and they invest a lot of money mm -hmm. into things like light bulbs. And yeah. then we can't even make light bulbs work the way that we say that we think we can and consumers are going to be even more reticent to jump on an even unify, more yeah, expensive we can, we can platform. Agree on one unified uh, protocol just to work on everything, but everything you buy has its own app. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, I just felt like in, in, in light of Vision Pro fizzling the way that, again, I, I like uh, to, no, to has, further dislocate our, our, our shoulder and pat ourselves on the back. Um, to, to see that Vision Pro did become the consumer conversation we thought it would be, a mm -hmm. spike of interest, then it actually made it into other people's hands and immediately fell off the radar for any type of regular consumer com uh, commentary. And the disappointment that I think a lot of Apple fans felt when news of a car program fell apart. I think a lot of people were interested in seeing what could no, Apple bring that was a to big, that connected was car tech. One of the other longest rumors, and I see every yeah. year. I always love to see the the new model another decade. Whatever, another this decade. is the year we're going to see the Jelly Bean finally yeah. launched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, it was like what? And then they're like, okay, so there was six hundred people working at Apple on this on these projects, and they're that's basically how they scrapped it. We found out exactly how it is, and it's basically they're like, yep, yeah, we don't have, we won't be able to reinvent the wheel here all manufacturers are either sitting with the uh, media tech or with qualcomm already and for us to jump in with our m series it would like uh yeah like uh, in a in a world of uh people owning supercomputers multiple supercomputers around their person you know phones tablets laptops etc yeah you don't have a market that you can disrupt like the original iphone did Yep. The original iPhone came at a time where, man, I would go to some friends' houses and they might not even have had dial-up still. You know, like you were still in that era of limited connectivity, limited experiences, very simplified experiences for this blossoming internet. And, you know, I like I, I mocked the first iPhone because I had a 3G capable Windows mobile device that could run actual Windows cab programs and I had a full editing suite for Word and spreadsheets and stuff like that. Like I had all this stuff. I actually took a huge step backwards 
in functionality switching over to Android when Android became a competitor. It was it was a very we, yeah, especially coming over for me from uh, from Palm or from BlackBerry, where you had such a well developed and well organized ecosystem to jump yeah. into Android and try to refigure how everything was. It, it was it was a sh I mean don't get me wrong I it was I a shift I, it was a very big shift but it was also something I didn't fully fully jump into till about six months into it because I still carried my uh, I think it was at the prom prev uh, at the time that I'm, I was running from and I went from that over to uh, the first Nexus and I think yeah. for me it was still. You know what I mean? Like it didn't have a front facing camera. Not that I needed it at the time, but <laughs> even the camera but on still, the back. It was like th these, these time, these things, these experiences. It was that a lot like, smaller. Oh. There's the form factor yeah. too. It, like I hold it now and it's still like a tiny little, how did I think that was a big, small, big, big phone? I have no idea. Unless my right. hands were much, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, I, like scale has just changed as I've gotten older. Yeah. So I, I, I think this is one of those things where we start talking about Apple deserving kind of a consumer perception market yeah. correction. They they have built so much emotional goodwill over generations of marketing and advertising, and often in eras where I feel like they've deserved it. The original 1984 ads, mm -hmm. the fun playfulness and the the confrontational uh, stance on the Mac versus PC ads. I remember that later on. That was fun to watch. Sorry, I, I, as much as bringing, they kind of yeah. yeah, they were they were fun commercials. I mean, they 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 were sort of a. Um, I think they were an early example of Apple misrepresenting the capabilities of their um, competitors mm -hmm. because I think they do that now strategically and targeted in a very insidious way but it was fun in the way that those Mac versus PC ads originally did it and then stumbling into this consumer um, into this consumer perception of mobile computing and and like they had the success with the iPod, they knew consumers liked carrying this little brick of songs, and that catapulted them into the iPhone being the the sort of dominant platform that it is today. So you can't do that with tech now, though. What what about an iPad or an iPhone is going to be so enhanced by a line of home automation accessories or, or robot arms or automated vacuums or other accessories? that someone is going to take a look at and say like, yeah, but I can just hold my iPad. In fact, it's even better if I just hold my iPad because then I don't have to like detach it from a robot arm to take it with me into another room. I, I, I guess the, the, the thing is we need to see an Apple that has someone other than Tim Cook at the head of the company to drive an exciting future of innovation. Yeah. And Tim Cook is an incredible operations guy. He has made Apple more profitable than any other company except for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of guy Tim Cook is. He goes in to make a, 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 a deal with TSMC to get preferential um, manufacturing space. He gets all the chips. He gets all the manufacturing. He does all the assembly, all the packaging. He's put it all together. You're making more money than you ever have. But you don't have an ideas guy at the head of Apple. And I think it seems like in the modern era of Tim Cook, Apple has kind of been out of ideas. They've had great success in operations, but they haven't disrupted like we've seen since the iPhone launched. It, it, it is truly like it, it, what we were also in a different era, I would probably say is at the time, we, those are when the new form factors were being released, new functional options. Yeah. Like, like, you know, for sure. Again, uh, they have to justify a bigger display. They have to explain like, no, you really need a bigger display on a tablet because it provides you a better solution. <laughs> it's a for sure bigger, you know, uh, bigger frame to what the iPhone is like, just bigger is better. The, 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 again, not to say that we won't see innovation. It just, it is very few and far apart. That's literally what it is. And, and I feel like Apple just has not built themselves within Tim Cook's reign no. to be that company. It's been to put them in a position to capitalize on that. Exactly. Yeah. To, to have the investments in whatever future technologies. And also, I do want to point out that we're talking about this from a business insider story, mm -hmm. that it's also not fair that the emotional perception of a company matters more than the actual financial success of the company. Because if Apple can't recreate the success of the iPhone in the next five years, it won't be a stock price falling because Apple's making less money. It'll be a stock price falling because shareholders want to see 
the, you know, the same incredible growth that happened with the iPhone. And that can't be possible today. There's no market that is so entrenched in an older philosophy to be disrupted that you can show line goes up, skyrocket to the moon, investor strategy growth. No one can succeed at that. Dave Burns just popped in. I knew he would. Cancerous growth. That's what they want in, in profits and earnings and all of these quarterly calls. So th this is like this the double-folded frustration. One, I am kind of frustrated at the media's perception of Apple being the only company that's ever allowed to do things. Mm -hmm. But two... Even Apple can't survive shareholder expectations. And, and that's ridiculous to me that one of the most sex successful and profitable companies on the planet can't find a way to recreate the magic of the iPhone. And they're going to be talked about like, well, that's an investor fail. <laughs> like, what are we doing? This is such fake money that we're dealing with now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, valuations are always uh, very subjective. <laughs> very much. For sure. Well, folks, um, I think that's about where we should tap it because we've gone over two hours and I was trying to get TK uh, sort of in a not into a two and a half to three hour podcast. TK, uh, thank you for jumping in. Um, oh, I really appreciate, appreciate you dropping by to not, not I mean, because we get to talk regularly, but then oh, no, also right. for my flavor yeah. of the link and politics side of this, too. I love having you here it, to share. It's absolutely thoughts. refreshing to, to be part of the show. And uh, last time I was able to be a part of it, I think it's like fully part of it, not when I was in Barcelona, but like, you know, we was able to join you in it's fun it's fun to be able to just uh you know have a different kind of conversation to our normal weekly conversation which we'll see you guys again on thursday evening but yeah, yeah we will be back on schedule and you've heard from both of us this week and the newsy show but if you want the more chill kind of relaxed tech gadget conversation we'll be back on thursday best of our week on youtube and on twitch and we'll, we'll chat that stuff out there um not only for my channel uh the some gadget guy channels but also tk bay um across all of social media tk dsl 8655 and uh, his own youtube channels and uh um, the, the videos that he's going to be putting out over the next week. So definitely stay tuned for some cool tech commentary, but across all of the yeah. tech landscape, please keep up with all of our friends out there. The, uh, tech nomads, the, uh, digital nomads, the, uh, Barry Johnson's gadget goddesses, LaShawn's Ike, Ike's tech talks, uh, tech preachers, um, uh, El Jefe reviews for yeah, some good yeah. audio kit. Uh, Michael Pepper Tech was in this chat. Uh, he's a, he's a very thoughtful tech commentator. We've got a lot of really fun nerds and geeks out here uh, trying to tell fun stories. So, uh, folks, I want you all to have an amazing week. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology, and uh, I want you to keep taking care of yourselves in these ever uh, changing climates and these. Uh, ever dark news cycle days, physically, mentally, emotionally, so that you can keep being the good tech neighbors. I know you are. I'll catch you back next week for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA podcast channel. Be safe, take care. I love you all, and I'll catch you back. <laughs>